All right, it's 4.03. I'm going to call this community oversight board meeting to order. Start with the reading of the appeal statement pursuant to the provisions of 2.68.030 uh, of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Um, we have quorum and I know our other board members are on their way. Um, so we can start with the approval of the minutes. If anyone had any corrections there, if not, I'll take a motion. Move approval of the minutes, Mr. Strieger. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, any focused discussion on that? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. I um, am going to switch around my chair remarks to after our um, guest speakers, so we can go ahead and give our guest speakers the time that they need to present. So, um, if Inspector Imhoff and Ms. Cirillo are here, um, we're, we're ready for you. Good afternoon, Hello. Chair um, Martinez and members of the board. It's a pleasure to be here. I am Diaz Cirillo. Um, I'm senior policy advisor with um, Mayor John Cooper's office, and um, I thought I'd kick it off um, with a few um, points to cover that helps to set the context for our discussion today, if you would allow me to do so. Um, and uh, so you should have um, before you um, a handout, a PowerPoint handout, and I'm just going to refer to my slides. Um, I think what is important as we think about the rollout of the co-response pilot, which we're also calling partners in, in, in care, partners in care, is that um, this is the result of an ongoing dialogue that has happened across Metro Nashville over the last year, but also based on work that has been done previously over the last five years that was led by the health department through a program called the Community Mental Health Systems Improvement. Amanda Brock, who uh, will follow us, um, was involved in that work. But, you know, I think in terms of, the, of how we got to this point today, Really, the Mayor's Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council was engaged in the discussion around the Policing Policy Commission. Um, the Policing Policy Commission approached um, the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council for recommendations around um, behavioral health and policing. And in October of last year, they produced um, their recommendations to the PPC. Um, and um, you have a copy of those recommendations. And as you can see in those recommendations, they do talk at length about a co-response pilot. Um, and I share with you in my slides the individuals who are, um, who form the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council. Um, that council now numbers about 21 individuals. The new private sector co-chair is Katina Beard out of Matthew Walker Comprehensive Health Center. Um, and there have been some new additions in um, this fiscal year. In addition, as you know, the Policing Policy Commission, which had very strong representation across Nashville, including the former chair of the Community Oversight Board, um, as well as members of community organizations who've been deeply involved in this discussion, um, to produce recommendations that really pointed to the need to really stand up a co-response pilot. Um, so this, this was not a decision that was made quickly. This was not a decision that was made easily. There was robust debate and discussion in the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council. Um, there has been ongoing conversation between the Mayor's Office and the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council. Mayor Cooper um, presented to um, BWAC, as we like to call it, in June of 2020 to talk about the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and emotional wellness of individuals across Davidson. That's been a huge issue, um, certainly, that is being looked at um, 
So it's really, as we move into this discussion around the co-response pilot, it's come out of that whole dialogue um, with over 60 individuals, um, community representatives, um, clinicians, uh, community providers, um, really an important cross-section of who we are as Nashville. Um, one of my slides shows the investments that have been made this year in behavioral health. Um, I think it's important to note that um, the city council especially um, really made a historic investment in the crisis treatment center and the crisis stabilization unit, which mental health co-op supports and hosts. And that's a $2 million investment. It helps to close their budget. Um, another important FY22 budget investment is $1.4 million to MNPS for what are called advocacy centers to support all elementary school children. This is an opportunity to ensure that children who are experiencing emotional distress um, have an opportunity to step out and work with a clinician who can help them with coping skills and self-regulation before they have to step back into the classroom. In addition, what we saw in May was the financial authority and allocation of about half a million dollars to fund the co-response pilot, also known as Partners in Care. And then finally, in March, uh, there was an opportunity. Uh, Mayor Cooper um, reallocated state grant monies um, for $1 million for what is called the Behavioral Health Crisis Response Initiative. That was a cornerstone initiative that actually forms part of the community safety program that was funded at uh, by another $2 million in that reallocated state grant funds. But this cornerstone program, which I'm on slide seven right now, for the Behavioral Health Crisis Response Initiative really supports <laughs> the analytical framework for partners in care. Um, it invests in two epidemiologists who will be looking at mental health crisis data across Nashville, um, Davidson County. Um, it also will support the funding of what is known as the Behavioral Health Needs Assessment, um, which will help us better understand what resources are available um, across uh, communities. And finally, it provides some monies for pilot projects that speak directly to crises in addiction, mental health, and youth. Um, so I wanted you to be aware of that because that also came out of a lot of these conversations over the last year. In terms of Partners in Care, as you know, it launches on June 28th. It specifically invests in what is called the crisis continuum. Um, mental Health Co-op is designated by state contract to be the Davidson County uh, crisis provider. Um, so that means um, based in terms of how do we support services in the crisis continuum, they are the provider that help us do that. Um, so this is the primary reason why they are at the table and helping to shape the discussion around this. Um, and as I've said before, this is a really, you know, inaugural effort for Davidson County to work on this. Um, so it's a year-long uh, pilot project. It's in North and Hermitage precincts. There are four purposes to this pilot project. Um, obviously, paramount is improving access to care for those who are experiencing behavioral health crisis. Um, it is absolutely about reducing um, and diverting individuals from the criminal justice system. Um, it's also about improving the communication across systems and, um, and most importantly, really supporting the safety of consumers, clinicians, and officers. The mayor's office has taken a deep interest in seeing this pilot get off the ground. We understand that the success of this pilot will be based on the involvement of multiple departments across Metro Nashville. Um, first and foremost is MNPD, which is the pilot host, and then of course Mental Health Co-op, who's a service provider, as well as a data contributor. And we're very interested in creating a data backbone to this so that we can better understand the impact of this pilot um, in, um, you know, across the county. Um, DEC, the Department of Emergency Communication, has put into place a new call structure. Um, and um, MPHD, the Public Health Department, is, as I have said before, um, you know, going to um, host two new epidemiologists to specifically look at the data of the program across these departments. And they will also be hosting the third party evaluation. Um, Fire EMS is also a data contributor. 
Um, and Hub Nashville is um, going to ensure call referral to the Department of Emergency Communications, and they will contribute data as well. We have put together an initial performance plan. Um, there are five key questions, but these don't represent the only thing that we want to learn from the pilot, but I think they're very important because they speak to the pilot's efficacy. Um, you know, is it really delivering on its charge? Is it really working? So I think the most important question is, does the pilot answer mental health related calls in pilot precincts? Uh, you know, two, does it connect individuals to behavioral health care and community services? Does it reduce arrests? And importantly, you know, what is the, eff the um, effectiveness of the program? Does it have an effect on transports by EMS for psychological disturbance in these precincts? Does it ensure the safety of consumers, participating clinicians, and officers? Um, so I wanted to be sure we could start our discussion today with the perspective from the mayor's office, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Arlo. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, it's not a good program that's been needed. Uh, the biggest problem we have uh, with the school institution where kids really have a mental issue. And been in the past where uh, you call the SRO and lock him up. Mm -hmm. right. You just move the problem from one situation to another one. Right. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> the, you don't know what these kids go through. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, is a program needed. Mm -hmm. Very important point. And uh, I just want to say that, you know, from the mayor's office, uh, we are very committed to connections to care. Um, and that's really what that, that is about, you know, what really needs to happen. And we're, we're excited about the advocacy centers. That's an opportunity to help really empower a child with skills that are constructive in their lives um, and to ensure that the teachers don't have to be the individual providing that as well, to make sure that there are clinicians there who can help kids do this. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, so um, I have two questions. My second question is kind of like where Mr. Holloway was going. Uh, but my first question is about the $2 million. Mm -hmm. Um, is that that's just this is just a budget line item question? Is that including the public safety? No, it's a direct allocation in the city budget. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. So it'll be reoccurring. Yeah, that clear. That's that was my next question. Yes. Okay. Um, so it would be reoccurring for the pilot. So the pilot is funded through American Rescue Plan dollars. Right. Uh, the intention, the reason why we are creating this whole data backbone, <clears throat> is because the intention is absolutely to expand it. Um, this is, we see this as a first step. Um, and so as the dollars came in, this was an opportunity to use those dollars specifically for this person purpose because it is focused on connections to healthcare. And if you will, if you will recall, the American Rescue Plan really focuses on public health issues right. um, as they've been created through the pandemic. Right, right, right. right. Thank you, thank you. So, so no matter what the results are as far as these questions, the pilot will be expanded. That is absolutely the intention. Uh, right. the, the questions help us understand what is the pilot actually doing? What do we need to do to ensure continuous process improvement? Mm -hmm. And how do we expand um, as we go along? Okay, that makes sense. And so, and so my second question was directly associated with the school resource officers. I know the advocacy centers um, in all elementary schools, what is gonna be the relationship between the uh, clinicians, I think is the word, mm -hmm. and the student resource officers, the school resource officers. You know, I don't have exact information about that, but I can absolutely get back to you. Um, but the advocacy <clears throat> centers are specifically to empower students with good um, emotional skills. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see an immediate connection to SROs in that, okay? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Witzel. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get clarity around something. Um, the mental health co-op is the uh, service provider. Um, is there? Is it the only entity that can provide that service for Davidson County? I was just wanting to get cl clarity around. So, that. based on the state grant, uh, the state mechanism, it 
the state you know, Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse identifies the crisis provider for every county and they have a map and they uh, really establish that in the contract provisions for services so that there's not overlap because it's important to have one point organization in the crisis continuum. The crisis continuum represents four components of care, but specifically for crisis, not for ongoing care. And I don't, I don't want to steal, um, you know, Ms. Brock's thunder here, but I'm sure she can come up and talk at length about the crisis continuum and how's that, how that is different from regular outpatient services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. McCree, did you have a question? Um, the whole one. Okay. Any other questions from uh, Mr. Hayes? Let's. Uh, two questions. The first one, uh, did you say that the pilot uh, is starting in North and Hermitage Precinct. Is there a specific reasons why you chose those precincts? And the second question is, can you quickly walk us through the process? If someone has a mental <coughs> crisis and they call, they make a call, what happens? I think that's a perfect segue for my colleague, Inspector Imhoff from the sure. police department, if you'd like to say that. As far as the question regarding why did we pick those two precincts, one, we looked at the data. We looked at the data that we had at the police department. We looked at DEC data, Department of Emergency Communications, to find out where we had the most mental health calls for service, where we had the most uh, suicidal calls for service, and the most psychological transports. And, try, and we found out that North uh, was high in those calls, Hermitage was high, as well as South. So one, Mental Health Cooperative is located in North, uh, and, and Hermitage in South, it could go either way. So we just went ahead, we wanted only two precincts. So since the, all three of them had a lot, highest call volume of the eight precincts that we had, we decided to go with those two. Um, what was your second question? I'm sorry. Uh, it was, if, if you could quickly walk us through the process. The call volume. If someone has a mental sure. crisis, yes, sir. what happens? There, there's different ways that we're getting calls triaged to the CIT team. Now, many people have heard that we've used the Denver model as kind of a, something we've leaned upon or looked upon. The Denver model, they have an officer and a clinician riding in a car together, and they just listen up for calls for service. And when they hear one that kind of sounds like it would be one appropriate for their services, they just kind of go to it. We didn't want to do that. We want to call specifically route it to the officers. So many times, as, a, as some people on this panel who've been on the police department before know, that many times that a call for service comes in, it doesn't automatically sound like a mental health call for service. So there are certain calls that we think would be red flags, like indecent exposure, trespassing, disorderly conduct, that could be red flagged where the dispatchers will know that, hey, that type of call, we need to go to the second set of questions to get more detail to find out if this would be an appropriate call for the crisis intervention team. So if they identify a call being one that would be appropriate for the crisis intervention team, then that car would directly be called to go to the, go to the to handle that call for service. That's one way we can get a call, so 911 or 8600. There's also Hub Nashville that can get a call for service, uh, and they can either send, depending on the acuity or the severity of the call or the crisis, they can send emails to the precinct, or they can transfer that call over to DEC for it to be uh, dispatched. Other ways that we can get calls for service are community leaders, people in the community just calling the precinct, calling 911, or uh, uh, I, I used to be at East Precinct for 10 years prior to be getting in this role. There's many times that I had emails from neighborhood leaders or even council members that said, hey, can you all have to go take a look at this? And those are, that's another way we can get the calls to the CIT team. Now, once the CIT team gets that call, they respond to the call, depending on the nature of the call, and these are gonna vary. Uh, the officer's responsibility is to stabilize the call. Once they get it stabilized, then it's the responsibility of the clinician to, ex uh, to make an assessment and an evaluation and find out what is the best care that this person could need. Uh, now, there's different possibilities. It might be setting them up with uh, care within the community, outpatient care. It could be medication management. It could be setting them up with a service provider. And then that's one possibility. Those are options. Uh, another option, there might be a committal involved, a 6404 or 6101, uh, where somebody is committed to a facility. That could be a medical facility, that could be a psychiatric facility, that could be the crisis uh, treatment center. Uh, a third option could be depending on what has happened. And this is not the option that we want, but there's going to be certain circumstances where an arrest may be made. Okay? And if an arrest is made, we can go to, to booking and let them know that we think there's a mental health component to this. An example of this would be we get there, we realize there's a mental health component to this, but the person has a warrant for a very serious crime, such as, let's say, a homicide or an aggravated assault with a weapon. 
So we would go down there, but we'd also say there's a mental health component to this. We can make a referral for the Sheriff Hall's program, the Behavioral Care Center, and they could be transferred over there depending on if it's appropriate for their program and if the person volunteers to go to their program. But that's kind of a wide ranging. Every, every call is going to be a little bit different. Again, like uh, Ms. Cirello talked about, you know, the goals of the program is to get people that need this help into the health care system and not into the criminal justice system. That's our goals as well. Uh, to get them the best care needed, to streamline those services, and to get access to care for those people that are in crisis. Because that's what this program is mostly for, is to deal with those people with severe acu acuity and in crisis, and to go out there and meet the needs that they have where they're at. I hope that answers your question. Um, so I want to remind everyone to flip their name tag when there's a question. I think Ms. McCree, and then Dr. Kong, and then Mr. Witzel, okay. and then Mr. Witt. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is more of a clarifying question about um, um, the geographical layouts of the precincts. Yes, um, is the Madison area covered in either the North or Hermitage area a precinct? No, the Madison precinct is a precinct in and of itself. Okay. So this would not include them. Now let let me be let me uh, be clear on something. Just because these precincts are involved in this pilot program, mobile crisis, what our system we have right now, is still going to be in place. Those services are still going to be in place. The crisis treatment center will still be in place for all these different precincts, uh, as well as the third shift, because the third shift is not covered on either north or south. It's going to be a detail, which is 6.30 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then 2.30 in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night. Those are the hours, hours of coverage, Monday through Friday, during the pilot. You know, and after we get the data, after one year, we like to see this expand. We're going to get data from all these different components ourselves, uh, mental health cooperative, emergency rooms, EMS, emergency rooms, EMS, uh, as well as DEC to decide where we need to expand. Mm -hmm. And also our hope is also the training that our officers just got, the crisis intervention training that our officers just got who are participating in this program, that volunteered for the program, we're going to try to expand that to every officer in the uh, Custom Services Bureau or patrol. People that are wearing uniforms, they will all get this training over time. Perfect. Um, my second question is kind of a follow-up to that. So um, I know that the officers that are participating in this pilot could go to that Madison area. I know there is a mental health institution mm -hmm. in that Madison area and that many um, of the um, people who are institutionalized, once they're released, they can have housing in that area. Um, and we've seen higher calls in that, that area, maybe not as high as the North and um, Hermitage, but there is cause for concern as it pertains to um, mental health and public safety in that area. Um, moving forward, is that a priority um, for expansion? I, I think we're open to what, see what the data is going to show us. If the data shows us that Madison is a place we need to expand to next, obviously we will look at that and, and expand there. But we're going to base it on the data that we're going to have. Um, like I said before, we're still going to have the services that they have now. Uh, and we want to keep the, the, the crisis intervention teams in those pilot programs. Otherwise, if they start getting pulled all over the place, then it's now no longer a, a pilot program in those precincts. Now it's a countywide pilot. However, if there's exigent circumstances, they do have the ability to leave those precincts and go handle calls for service if there's exigent circumstances. Thank you. Dr. Kong. Right. Uh, I have a series of questions. So I'm just going to start to go through, and I apologize for my tardiness. Um, uh, you mentioned that the precincts that were selected was based on data uh, about the frequency of mental health calls. Um, I see here that mental health calls sort of defined as including substance use and suicide. Is that, I mean, does a police officer have to say this is a mental health call? This, like, what is the terms or warning that has to be used in order for that call to be identified as a mental health issue? Well, like I said, like I said earlier, sometimes <laughs> it's difficult on the face of the call like the face value of a call doesn't always come across as being a mental health call for service. Mm -hmm. It can be disguised as far as a neighbor calling that somebody is in decent exposure, trespassing, uh, disorderly conduct, wh whatever it may be. And when officers get there, if they determine, yes, this seems to have a mental health component to it, then they might, they're going to ask dispatch to change that call from whatever it was. Let's say a 1044 for a disorderly conduct. Go ahead and put a, put a clarifying code of 1035, which is the call, our call for mental health. Suicidal is 1063. Uh, once they get there, they might find that out, and then we try to change that. Now, um, we think we're going to get, as we go forward, you know, we're hopefully we'll get better data mm -hmm. since we're getting data collection from so many different parts of the city to make really good decisions as opposed to just us or DEC that we get EMS, fire, things of that nature, and mental health co-op getting their data to get really a more robust picture mm -hmm. of how we need to proceed. Great. 
Um, can you give a little context into the training of how then that, if, if it seems, if, I understand that spectrum is so wide, uh, what is the training that will go in for officers to be able to better identify when to be able to use this 1035 code? And also, um, uh, yeah, you can answer that first and I'll ask my second question. Okay. Well, right now the officers in the academy that haven't been part of this program, they are already get a great deal of mental health training just when they're in the academy. Uh, mental Health Cooperative has been providing, and you can probably answer this better than I, but they've been providing training since the early 2000s. 2001. 2001 to our academy, and we've also had in-service training on this. So right now, uh, just at the academy, we have uh, uh, 48 hours of just mental illness training, uh, de-escalation training, mm -hmm. and training in dealing with folks with disabilities. Now, on top of that, the officers that volunteer for this program, they went through 40 hours of, of crisis intervention training. And I can give you what they, they went through, if that's what you'd like. Um, um, so, the, uh, sorry, just to clarify, ahead. though, will there be additional training on specifically these codes and how to identify? Just because I, I think what I'm, I'm wondering is sure. what is sort of the accountability measures in terms of, like, reviewing the data and ensuring that as many calls that, did quali that should have qualified mm -hmm. as a mental health call were actually identified as a mental yes, health Yes, DEC, call. as they go through their call triage, mm -hmm. they are going to be collecting data throughout the city to find out what calls would they have dispatched a CIT team if there's one available, let's say in Madison. They'll be able to say, if we had a CIT team in Madison, we would have dis dis dispatched this many calls to them if we would have had that. Right. So that's one point of data we're having. Also there's going to be, you know, we're emphasizing for officers if they determine, and, and let's, let's understand that officers aren't mental health professionals. Yeah. So when they go there, we're doing, you know, if you're having an officer in Madison, for instance, just because you brought it up that if they go to a call and they determine that I think this is going to be a 1035 call or they can still call mental health cooperative mobile crisis to come out to there and they make the final determination of exactly what type of situation they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. But just far as a lay person, if I go out to a call and a person is acting in such a way or saying things in such a way that would lead a reasonable person to believe that this is a mental health call, they can let dispatch know that please put a code on this for 1035. Okay. It's not a diagnosis. It's, it's not an official diagnosis. It's just based on their training that this appears to be. And a lot of time in those calls, that's when we will lean upon mobile crisis to come out there and make the final determination of what needs to be done. Okay, um, and then just a couple more questions, I apologize. Um, based on the amount of data that you have now and the capacity that mental health co-op has and what the way the pilot with program is designed, do you imagine any gaps happening of there's not gonna be a mental health practitioner available to be able to uh, go along for a call? Or do you feel like your numbers are gonna match up pretty well with the need? I think for the, for the pilot project, we have the numbers that we need. We've also, in addition to six full-time staff dedicated to this, we are trained PRN staff to backfill in the event that, you know, people do need to take vacation. And then we also have our regular team, our regular crisis team, who can respond in the event there's not a, a, a co-response co clinician available at that time. Okay. Um, a few more things. Uh, I noticed, uh, I think, the last meeting that we had, a couple of the documents that we got on the program um, had the word mental illness involved or uh, mentally ill and, and so I just wanted to make sure and just encourage that any of the documentation or training provided don't, doesn't use terms like mentally ill that carry stigma and I think you know when we're thinking about the framing and the interactions we're seeing with people who are experiencing mental health issues that we're using that framing and, and I think that'll better encourage that you know interaction and so just wanted to encourage that um, and then the last piece um, I'm curious about the continuum in terms of uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad to see here that uh, repeats are basically going to be a metric of success, right? I, I assume the less number of people who are you know, having to have repeated calls like this, the better. Uh, how far along do mental health co-op providers go with individuals to seek ex uh, extra care or behavioral health care, community services? Um, and who are the partners you already have aligned for seeking those services? Sure. Well, let me first explain, for those of you who aren't um, aware of the continuum of care that we, we currently offer, um, as Ms. Cirillo said, we are the designated crisis provider for, for Davidson County, and that's been in existence since 1993. That's decided by the Department of Mental Health. Originally, that was just for a mobile crisis team. So clinicians who would respond to the community, emergency rooms, agencies, if they're an individual experiencing a mental health crisis, they would go do an assessment 
and determine what level of care is needed and connect that person to care. That could be outpatient care. It could be inpatient care if that is needed. Um, it could also be connecting them with <coughs> advocacy organizations. Often it's, it's a, uh, an individual who's early in their diagnosis. They're not willing to consent to treatment, but their family is concerned and wants to get educated. So we would refer that family to support networks like NAMI, the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, while, they work, while we work with their loved one to get insight into their illness. Over the years, as the need for mental health services has increased in our city, not just in our city, but across our state and country, we have evolved into developing a continuum of care. That now includes an eight bed, what we call respite program. That's for individuals who, where they can stay overnight, it's located in our office in Metro Center. If they've had a mental health crisis or a severe psychosocial crisis, let's say, they are an individual who suffers from a mental illness, they're getting their medication, but they had a disruption in their housing, they lost their medication, they need to get stable, they know they need treatment, respite would likely be a good location for them. That's staffed with a mental health, um, a mental health clinician who makes sure that they, they take their medication, but it's more of a situation to deal with their psychosocial stressors. We've had that service from the late 90s, but again, as need grew, we had to develop more services. So the next level of service would be our walk-in center where individuals can walk in 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get an assessment and linkage to care. Um, we've had that since 2001, but more robustly in 2019 when we got funding for the crisis treatment center, we've seen that service explode. We currently assess about 250 walk-ins a month. These are individuals who either walk in on their own, family members bring them in, or they call our crisis line and we send transportation to go get them or we send a clinician out to assess them and bring them back to the crisis treatment center. While they're there, they get seen by a nurse who does a basic medical screening to determine if there's any medical issue that needs to be addressed. There's counselors 24 seven. They also get a medication evaluation by a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner and we can initiate that treatment while they're on the unit. If they need, that, that service is typically for 23 hours. It's meant for short-term stabilization and get them linked with care. If they need longer than that, we have a 15-bed crisis stabilization unit that looks and operates much like an inpatient psychiatric unit. Um, this is for people who are having an acute mental health issue. They could be actively suicidal. They could be act having uh, psychosis, so they're suffering from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, and if they weren't getting care, they would likely pose a threat to themselves or others. But they have insight into their need for care. It's voluntary. They can go to the crisis stabilization unit where they get group treatment, daily rounds by a psychiatric provider, um, and discharge planning services. The typical length of stay there is about three days. So back to the real point of your question, how long would clinicians follow somebody and what our partners are? The great thing about this program is that if the co-response team goes out and sees someone and gets them connected with care, that could be an outpatient appointment, but there, it could be inpatient. The next week, the co-response team could go by and check on them. One of our clinicians as part of this team will be calling individuals post the intervention that the actual responders did to make sure they got connected with care. And if we need to up that level of care, that's that point person's job to do that. Or they could say, hey, I need the co-response team to go back out and check on that individual. We will not only refer to our outpatient services, which we have a robust outpatient service, but we also work with partners like Centerstone, Park Center, um, other mental health agencies in the city who uh, are taking care of our vulnerable individuals who suffer from serious mental illness or are having an episode where they, they need to get short-term counseling. We will refer to those other community partners. Okay. Um, can, I promise, just two more questions really quick. Uh, your, in terms of your service providers, and I apologize if you already reviewed this, but um, who qualifies as a service provider under mental health co-op? Are you meaning for the, the clinicians who are yeah. part of this? Okay. So is it an MD, MP? Right. These are master's level clinicians, either in psychology, clinical social work, um, counseling. Um, the this, this six that we've identified for this program volunteered for this program, and they all have, on av when I looked at the average length of experience, <coughs> eight years is the average length of experience that these clinicians have in the field of mental health um, with our agency. Uh, majority of them are licensed in their discipline as a licensed pro professional counselor or a licensed clinical social worker. They will have the ability, and uh, all of our crisis counselors currently have the ability to consult if need be on a call. Uh, with a senior clinician, that could be myself, another member of our leadership team, 
or our on-call uh, psychiatric provider, which is a, a nurse practitioner. My very last question, I promise. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of different community partners, safety nets, different places for different needs to be met should a person need to be referred to care. It, do you imagine ever a situation where someone, you know, I, I imagine that this population is, is tends to be uninsured. Mm -hmm. um, do you imagine a situation where they could be caught with a surprise bill or just something happens where they're not able to be covered or they get sent to a provider that you don't have a partnership with? Um, and, and sort of what's the plan for that? Because I would hate for someone to be referred to care and then uh, not be able to pay a bill because of of their, their socioeconomic yeah. status. I totally agree with you. So just right now, 70, 65 to 70 percent of the people we treat in that continuum that I was mentioning are uninsured. Um, we do get state grants to help cover some of the costs for the uninsured, but the vast majority of people who we're treating are fit into that gap. Thankfully, um, we do get, there are programs called uh, the Behavioral Health Safety Net that's funded through the Department of Mental Health. Many of the individuals who we see, we are able to help them apply for coverage under the Behavioral Health Safety Net, and that pays for their medication management appointment, their counseling appointment, and some care coordination visits. So when they are admitted to our crisis treatment center or our CSU, they do not get a bill from us for those services. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we can connect them to Safety Net, which often we are, um, they don't. They that coverage is there. Um, I'll be honest, the, the the population I'm most concerned about in terms of possible gaps in coverage are individuals who, are, who we see who are undocumented citizens, or undocumented residents. Um, they, we cannot get them connected to safety net. They have to have um, a valid social security number and ID for us to get them qualified for safety net. So that is a service, a service gap in our area. Great, and actually, last question. Uh, how many languages are represented by the service providers that you have? We have on our entire crisis team, we have two that speak Spanish, that is the primary. Um, we hope to expand that, but right now, if we have an individual who English is not their primary language, we have to use the language line. Okay. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. You can follow your work on this. Mr. Mitzel. Um, I have two questions. Um, with this, with the co-response model being new, um, will a caller be told what they're getting, like we're, that, that an officer and clinician will be sent um, to the scene? Mm -hmm. Will they be, is that something they'll, they'll, be, to they'll be told? Mm -hmm. Well, that's 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 an excellent question. That's uh, that's something that Steve Martin, the director of emergency communications, that's that's something we can we can explore. Uh, I'm not sure that has been addressed, and that's a good question. Um, Inspector. Yes. Uh, oh. oh, he's right there. I didn't even see you. Come on up. I was 15 minutes early in Sunny West, where I thought this meeting was. So I apologize for the half hour delay in my arrival. Uh, to address your, your question, I'm Stephen Martini, the director of the Emergency Communications uh, Department. I appreciate the opportunity to join these the, these folks in this such great initiative. Uh, to answer your question, we are not currently uh, planning to tell folks who call what type of response they'll receive, uh, only because we don't now. Uh, when folks call, we don't tell them that they can expect uh, uh, what type of training the officers are arriving to their scene. We just gener generally say we're dispatching police or fire or medics uh, to, to the scene to assist. Uh, there may be some benefit in telling folks that we've got a, a social worker or a licensed clinician coming to the scene to assist with the, the call, uh, but right now it would be out of, out of the norm of how we usually dispatch calls. Um, my second question would be, um, what if, is there any concern that when a, a police officer arrives to the scene that it may elevate um, you know, it may heighten the situation if someone is having a, a crisis and they are they see a uniform and they see flashing lights or whatever. Because I've seen flashing lights before, you know, on a normal day, and that has made me nervous. So, what do you, have, have, is there any concern, or and if that does happen, or if the family member or someone requests that uh, the police officer not be involved, how does that play out? If there's if there's no you know sign of danger if there's no weapon sure. or anything like that when we were researching different programs and we were talking to denver and trying to find out the best way we were looking at uniform non-uniform mark car not mark car trying to figure out what would be the best approach uh and in talking to denver uh they found having a mark car with a uniformed officer and the clinician was was the best practice for them the reason for that is the vast majority of time that officers have arrived to scenes it doesn't heighten just because because a lot of these people that are frequent callers have seen the police several times uh, and the vast majority of the time there's not uh, just from our mere presence. 
Now, I can't speak for every single time ever. And the majority of the calls that we get, depending on the type the call is coded, a lot of times it's not going to be bl blue lights and siren. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only time it's going to be blue lights and siren is if, like, there's injury involved. Uh, so typically that's not going to happen. Uh, some of the advantages of having a uniformed officer and uh, the clinician in a marked car is because we know we're not at the point to have 24-7 coverage. We know we're not going to always have that clinician in the car to be able to answer these calls for service. And even if we had a specialized unit with plain clothes and unmarked cars, we probably wouldn't have 24-7 coverage. So there's going to be times we're still going to have an officer that goes to those calls, let's say third shift, Madison, wherever it may be, they will still have to answer those calls. So we look at, and, and this, was, this is what Denver had replied to us, is that when you have those good connections with the CIT team, then the, the way they will perceive the next uniform officer coming to their scene will be much better. It'll be advantageous. Uh, the other part of that is, like I said before, we're hoping to get every uniformed officer the CIT training, uh, the crisis intervention training across the board for the whole department. But we found that one, you're not having that situation happen very rarely. And secondly, it's going to be very beneficial when they have those positive interactions, when they do have to have a uniform officer come to their scene because we, are, we, we, we realize we probably will not have 24-hour, 24-7 coverage all the time. Even if we went countywide, there will be times where our CIT team may be tied up and the officer will have to go to those calls. And a lot of times these are crisis calls with a high acuity. So even if we didn't have a counselor, then we're still going to be getting an officer that's going to be getting called to those. Is there anything? Thank you. Yeah, I think I definitely hear what you're saying. Some people, um, you know, because of trauma reactions, it's it's a situation that they're heightened regardless. Somebody's coming into their, their home or where they're at. Um, I have seen the opposite effect sometimes with mental health clinicians, particularly if it's somebody who's had a repeated history of involuntary hospitalizations. Um, when the mental health clinician gets there, they're paranoid about us. And so they often look to the officer as somebody who, oh, you're here to make sure that mental health clinician doesn't take my rights away. That happens sometimes too. I think the important part is that we work as a partnership and that if there, once uh, we get to the scene, if the scene is, is safe, the clinician takes the lead at that point. And, they, and if the individual is connecting great with the clinician, we go with that. Um, I was part of the training that the officers did last week and got to see them do their scenario-based training. There's some very gifted officers on how they de-escalate situations. Um, they showed a lot of compassion and awareness of trauma reactions as they're approaching a situation. And I fully believe that as we move forward that pilot, those officers and those clinicians working together will help de-escalate those situations. Thank you. Mr. Wynn. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, it was well overdue. I just, I'm happy to hear this today. Uh, first is the comm center. Um, so does this mean that every call for service that comes in to the comm center, there'll be a screening for a mental health issue? And if it is, then is there a protocol for the dispatcher then to ask for the questions to dispatch a CIT team? And once you realize you've got a, a mental health crisis at that address, then in the call history for the night shift, the day shift, and other shifts that will follow on, because usually these are repeat calls at the same address, well, every other detail know before they respond to a call so they'd be prepared for a mental health crisis along with a call for service. Sure, I'm glad you asked yeah. that question. That's what I pulled up here on my phone is some of the things we're doing to exactly yeah. that. Uh, uh, to answer your questions, yes, yes, and yes, and then let me get a little more detailed okay. on, on each. Uh, uh, yes, the call history exists in, in uh, our computer-aided dispatch system, and it is there always. That's not something we're creating for this event. That's, uh, that's, that's always there as long as our CAD system has been in place, which is a little over a decade now. So there's a pretty comprehensive amount of data on a given address. Uh, now, how much, how reliable that is changes some as people move right so you may have history associated there that is no longer the last three years because the person who lived there changed and the residence is different um, but that history does exist so these calls that will occur that will be screened for and, and documented will be available for reference by the dispatcher and by the the officers responding and and field sergeants lieutenants and for historical purposes if we attempt to uh, to do some reporting on this we can use all that data that will be available for sure uh, we are putting in place uh, eight 
what we call guide cards. These are uh, similar cards or concepts that we've already had in place for medical and fire type calls for uh, several years. Basically, a script that says we're going to ask these certain types of questions uh, that feed to or away from a particular um, symptomology. I don't want to say diagnosis. When On our side, we're not trying to figure out uh, what's wrong. We're just trying to assess the symptoms and determine who is the best uh, response, whether that's fire, law enforcement, or, or, uh, or EMS, or some combination of those three. Those call types, to your point, are uh, mental health consumer calls, uh, suspicious activity, suspicious person type calls, uh, intoxicated person calls, your general welfare check that says we just haven't seen this person they're overdue they didn't come to work whatever that is just go check on them type of call an indecent exposure call suicide threats disorderly persons domestic incidents and anytime ems may request law enforcement on a medical call that when they respond they say we need law enforcement assistance uh, typically that would benefit from having a, a, a clinician we believe on scene to help with whatever is escalated or caused that conflict uh, each one of those call types, we call them kind of a, a chief complaint. Whenever somebody calls and reports one of these types of issues, somebody's trespassing, we have an intoxicated person, there's a series of questions that we're asking to determine whether there's uh, any danger to the individual, to others around them, and if there's any mental health history, uh, whether that's known or not known, or any symptoms demonstrated by the person involved that might give us the impression that there's a mental health history. So that there could be a benefit to dispatch uh, one of these co-response vehicles with the officer and the clinician together to this to this call. Uh, like Inspector Imhoff mentioned, we're going to take those calls and ask those questions everywhere in the city, even though we know we're focusing on two precincts for this, uh, this pilot project, so that we have that data as we look to expand later where, where are the places in the city that could benefit from those the most. And we will have that data internally. This is a, a pretty normal concept for our dispatchers since they've been using this uh, the same process to uh, deliver babies and give CPR instructions for CPR saves for many years to take these eight concepts and apply them over in the law enforcement world. It's just a different set of questions but following that same process. Does that answer all the yeah, questions? Yeah, so, so it, it is a standard universal question on every call-in from every citizen. Yes, sir, absolutely. Okay, okay. all right. Thank you. The, the other question was for the inspector. Uh, they, the uh, Ohio Police Department right now is in a lawsuit mm -hmm. because officers arrived on a domestic violence call, labeled the victim mentally disturbed, didn't take a report, and left the scene the next day she was murdered by her husband. So my question about domestic violence and the mental health issues is, that, as you know, offenders label victims mentally disturbed is to manipulate the police response on sure. a domestic violence and sex assault call, often. Sure. So how often will the CIT units and the domestic violence division work together so there's no confusion about the victim being mentally disturbed claimed uh, claim by the, by the defendant, or the, excuse me, the, the, sure. uh, the, the suspect, not the defendant. Well, and, and, the la and the last mm -hmm. thing is this, um, are the hostage negotiators willing or have they trained with CIT as an asset when they do their face-to-face -face negotiations with sure. somebody who is mentally disturbed? Right now, Mental Health Cooperative does do the training for our negotiator team and has okay. done so for right. quite some time. Good. Um, as far as the domestic violence calls, these are calls that we can go to, the, the, the CIT team can respond to as well. Because uh, even if there's not a mental health component to it, I think any victim of domestic violence has been through a traumatic incident, right. and it would be beneficial to have a therapist on the scene. And obviously that the, the therapist involved in this program, the CIT program, is obviously going to be open to discussing these things with the domestic violence detective. You know, it, everything's towards the care of the, of the person, of the consumer. Right. We want to make sure the consumer gets all the care they need, and if the detective needs any information from us to help them make determinations yeah. on their case, that would, we'd yeah. be open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Good one. Judge Brown. No. No. Um, then Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, so um, I have a couple questions. Uh, I first want to mention uh, I grew up not calling the police. So I do want to mention that it's a group of people that automatically won't be serviced through this program. But my three questions are around data, paperwork, and then just like the research, I think. Uh, Director Imho, I think you mentioned about looking at different programs. What made us zero in on this one? You kind of mentioned the research before. Sure. 
you know, there's been lots of talks about cahoots as well as uh, co-response. I think both are good programs. I think we've talked about it before. It's not a, it's not a one or the other. Mm -hmm. I think they're both very positive programs. I think they both can be utilized. Uh, I think the benefit of a co-response program if it addresses something that deals with people with severe acuity, acuity and that are in crisis. Uh, my understanding of a CAHOOTS program, from what I've read and talked to other folks about, is that they would not respond to folks that are aggressive, in severe acuity, or in crisis. This program can do both. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not against a CAHOOTS program. I think that a, 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 this program and a CAHOOTS pro program could be robust in the city. You know, I really do. Uh, when looking at the Denver program, they started their program in April of 2016 with three clinicians in a co-response program. I think three or four months later, they added three more clinicians. And then in January of 2017, they ended up with 17 clinicians. It wasn't until last year they started their STAR program, which is basically a CAHOOTS program, where you have EMS, paramedics, with social workers going out to those lower level folks that aren't in crisis, that aren't having showing that acuity. So they ended up having that program and they have both programs there. I'd like to see that happen in Nashville as well. I think this addresses people in crisis which is more needed at this particular time. But I think that we can definitely evolve to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my question on the same thing is just like the racial demographics of Denver. Um, are there any adjustments to being in a primarily black neighborhood like North Nashville? Well again we picked North Nashville based on the data. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had diverse officers and diverse clinicians involved in the program, which I believe we do, um, and I can get you those numbers. Um, but we, we want to we be able to address the needs of the people that we're serving. We want the people that we're serving to be comfortable with the, with the service that we're providing, whether it's through the officers or through the clinicians and through the training that they have. Uh, this is a pilot program. We know there's going to be hiccups. We know there's going to be things we need to work out. We want to address those things and make this over the next year as, as, as flawless as we possibly can before we expand it. Uh, but we're open to suggestions. We're going to be constantly going out and reviewing the cases. We're going to constantly be going out and reviewing things with the officers involved as well as the clinicians involved to see what are the things that we need to address as we go forward. Can I say one more thing about the data? We also looked at our data on uh, areas of town where we were getting calls that were pl already police-initiated calls. North Nashville, Hermitage were two of the higher sectors. The other thing we, we've seen in the last several years is unfortunately more and more calls coming into our crisis line where there is the threat of the weapon or severe agitation and aggression. And those calls were getting kicked back to police to respond. And I think this co-response helps address that problem. Instead of the officer going out there without the clinician on site, mm -hmm then we have two people who go out there together on those, those particular calls. So, so uh, since you brought up, thank you for that, since you brought up data, my question is around independent evaluation of the data. It feels a little bit that if we've already decided that we're gonna grow the model out, but we have things that we need to be curious about, like the reduction of arrest, I'm just curious on what internal leverage um, are in place to make sure that the data is being looked at in like an objective way. Yeah, I, can, I can answer that. Um, so as I mentioned in my presentation, one of the important partners around the table is the Metro Public Health Department. Um, so um, really they will be providing the data analytics for the pilot program so we can see the data you know, as the pilot begins and across its time, its lifetime. A third party evaluation really provides that third party perspective. Um, so that it gives you that insight into a pilot from somebody who is not associated with that pilot um, and, and helps us understand, um, you know, from a third party's perspective what was working and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a two-pronged approach. It's a best practice approach, which you should always be looking at data for continuous process improvement. So that's why we selected that approach. For sure, and I, and I love data just... Just FYI, and I think that might be a place that uh, we might be able to plug in, especially since we're independent body. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you talk about third-party evaluations, I love those as well. Um, and then my last question is just about paperwork, and this is just like maybe in the weeds a little bit, maybe getting ahead in a meeting, but we've had some issue before with police officers filling out their daily activity sheets, um, and that, is in, that has affected some of our investigations in the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what type of paperwork or paper trail 
will be created here just in case we do have a community member who is filing a complaint and we need to verify some things from an investigation mm -hmm. standpoint. For, for this program, we've come up with a new form just for the people that are working in the CIT program. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an officer and I'm assigned to the CIT unit that particular day, so I'm riding in a car or with a clinician with me, mm -hmm. there's a form I'm going to fill out on every single call I go out on. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then within that, that, in that paperwork, it's going to say, was this a, a crisis intervention team call, yes or no? If it's a no, we're kind of done with the form at that point. If it's a yes, we complete the form. And that's going to show us how many calls for service did the CIT unit respond to, mm -hmm. how many of those calls for service were actually CIT calls for service. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be uh, the data points that we're looking for uh, with those is, let me see if I can pull it up for you. Overall calls for service, number of CIT calls for service, arrests mm -hmm. made on CIT calls, mm -hmm. any use of force on those types of calls, type of force used, uh, injuries, and if weapons were involved. But that's to be done in every one, and there's going to be audits through my office to see we have different forms on which officers were working those shifts. Then we'll go in there and audit how many, how many of those forms they, they completed during their shift. It should be on every single call they go to, whether they're a backup car, mm -hmm. it's a self-initiated call, or a dispatch call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. McCree, did you have a question? No. no. Um, then Mr. Goddard. Yeah, just a couple of questions. First, I appreciate like very much if you've looked around looked at other programs trying, trying to see what's best practice and and defer to you on denver being a good idea there the follow-up on mr campbell Gucci's comment north national denver have some some different demographics do you plan or are you open to in this year-long pilot project trying different things to see if for nashville or these communities in nashville some different things work better i think mark versus unmarked police car might be an example i'm sure there are a hundred more you guys know that i don't You know, um, perfecting a pilot typically takes three years. Mm -hmm. um, so you really, you really are testing some very straightforward practices. They're new practices, and they have to be repeated over and over and over again for us to get a better understanding if they're working. So at this time, from the mayor's office perspective, we're very interested in really mobilizing this pilot and really ensuring that it does what it says it will do, which is to connect people to mental health care. Um, and so we don't see an opportunity to begin new um, or experimental processes in this first year of the pilot. That generally doesn't happen until a pilot has been minted into a fully blown program. So I'll just share that. Follow-up question, then. if there's a, a response and the crew goes with, with the pilot plan and it goes south, Mm -hmm. it, it's just a bad situation. Is there a plan to have an after action review, figure out what went wrong, different way to do it better, particularly there's a call at that same address mm -hmm. again and, and learn and grow from that? Anytime you have a critical incident, we do an after action report and we okay. review it. Uh, there's nothing going to be any different on this. If there's a critical incident or if you say something goes south, you know, paperwork will be filed. We'll, we, we'll, my staff as well as their staff will review that and we'll go over it and we'll, we'll critique it and find out what went right, what went wrong, and how can we improve. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Hayes. I was just curious um, if you have a way of measuring yourself, you know, because uh, most things, if you can't measure them, they're not really any good. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if, have you looked at any historical data that basically said, okay, this is the way it was, and then we, we're showing improvement over say what we were in the 90s or the 2000s and now we're doing because we got this great pilot program but how do you, how you plan on measuring yourself that's a great question and we're in the process of, of uh, working that up um, we're working on what is called the mental health baseline um, which will take a retrospective look over the last five years because, of course, the pandemic years were very unique years, so 2020 really doesn't give us a good sense of what happened in the county. Mm -hmm. um, and so we use that previous five-year baseline to help us understand the um, incidence of mental health crises in the county. Um, we also understand that um, there is overlap between individuals experiencing mental health crises and overdose crises and addiction crises. And so we want to also look at that, those data as well mm -hmm. in those contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing um, to get the baseline and then to get pilot project data 
to compare to that. And also the, the approach that was used, you know, I, I term it as a top-down approach. Uh, and again, you all have done an excellent job, you know, with the task you've been given. But I still view it as a top-down approach but with the police and commission and all that. Uh, but I would just ask, uh, I don't know if you, how many families that have, have been involved with mental health crisis have you, have you talked to, have you involved them? I just encourage you to involve families. Uh, they can probably give you a lot of information on we, that. We really appreciate that. And I just, um, you know, for the purpose of today's discussion, I think it's important to know that the Behavioral Health and Wellness Advisory Council does have an individual with lived experience in mental health. Um, and the Policing Policy Commission, we really um, worked hard to ensure that voices of individuals who had been with lived experience um, with um, the police force have were were on that commission, mm -hmm. um, so there there was certainly an attempt to capture those voices. But I appreciate that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and can I just add one one thing on that? Because I think that's a very important thing about getting the input of family members. We actually, as part of the training, 40-hour training that the officers got, we brought in three individuals who are family members of, of individuals with severe mental illness and had them tell their story and go through that with the officers because you're exactly right. We need to get the input of the people who we are serving, and I think mm -hmm. having them not, on, not only getting their feedback as we move along this process but also having them involved in the training to share their experience is incredibly helpful. Thank you. Dr. Conn. It seems like you, you had listed a couple of the metrics that you'd be capturing. Um, would any of the information that's captured in the after action report, like if something was done, you, you mentioned this after action report, be part of that data that's also going to be analyzed? If it's a critical incident, we're going to have the after action. That's not going to be, that would typically not be part of the data that we're collecting to evaluate the program overall. Uh, that's going to be, like I said, it was going to be done through a third-party evaluator. There's an epidemiologist over at the Par Department of Health that's going to be, we've already done MOUs for data collection sharing where they can pull information from us, pull information from hospitals, uh, me 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 mental health cooperative, to try to get an overall view of what's going on. Uh, we're open to talking about, to a certain degree, of the critical incident. It depends on what the critical incident is, too. Uh -huh. uh, so it varies on what the incident is. But yes, any type of cri critical incident we have, we're going to do an after action that probably would not be part of just the data yeah. that we're showing. I guess because it sounded like to me the after action report contains a lot of the more qualitative pieces and the conversations that are happening with all the different partners of sort of what went wrong and the debriefs and if there's any patterns arising I imagine that could be really critical to assessing then how the program is going, where key pieces would be improved. And all the partners that are involved in that would be in part of that discussion. Part of the discussion for the action yeah, sure. report. Which is why I think if, if that data is available to some extent, uh, either within the MOU or uh, moving forward in terms of your assessments, I think there's a and lot, a lot of the general data, data in that critical incident will already part will be part of the data that we're collecting. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess it's hard for me to like visualize sort of the sort of qualitative pieces that are going to be captured. Well, right? you, the police department is going to capture just some basic data, like the data yeah. that I went over. Mental health cooperative is going to be collecting a lot of that, you know, diagnoses, uh, connection to care, follow-up medication, things of that nature that we wouldn't be capturing. So there's different entities that will be capturing different types of information. Right. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm curious, like, if there's, you know, even room for, like, interviews with the different service providers, um, you know, available just to be able to capture more, like, by, like, what they are able to share by word. Mm -hmm. This is what I experienced. This is what I saw. This is what worked in the field. This is what, what not didn't work in the field rather than just relying on very like quantitative mm -hmm. numbers. And I think that we can do that as well. I mean, I think that's something that the uh, the case managers in these cases that are going to be connecting with service mm -hmm. providers are going to be getting their input. But. Absolutely. I mean, we're going to be meeting with the clinicians um, to go over exactly what you just said. What's worked? What hasn't worked? Let's look at the type of calls you've been going on and share that information. Um, the, this team is being led by one of our uh, very experienced crisis uh, supervisors, a program manager, who is committed to getting that more qualitative piece. Mm -hmm. In addition to, we're going to be doing follow-up phone calls with individuals who we've gone out with and sometimes that information is so rich as to yeah. what worked for them what didn't work so that we can not only do better but put that in the record for that person because each crisis is very individualized what worked for 
for me in a crisis may not work well for you in the crisis, but we'll be able to capture that so that if we do get a call from that for our service for that individual in the future, we will have that information. Okay, and so it is for the pilot in terms of the work plan, it's a, it's a uh, plan to collect all this data and do the analysis at the end of the year, or is there like quarterly assessments? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, because yeah. that was something I was hoping to have a chance to um, share with you tonight, which is that the um, we are moving forward with a stakeholder council um, that will receive quarterly um, reports on the pilot. Um, we can certainly make that available to you all and other members of the public um, to, you know, share the work and share our progress in it. Great. Yeah, I, th I imagine, I, mean, I don't want to speak for the COB, but I, you know, I be interested in hearing those reports and updates as they're coming out. And so oh, we'd be chance for y'all to come back. Yeah, we'd uh, be delighted to do so. Mr. Ingle from the NOAA Criminal Justice Task Force to speak. He called your name. <laughs> Thank you, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it ain't no we way. got off to a great start, didn't we? <laughs> uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I see a lot of friends up here, so it's, it's good to see you all. Uh, <clears throat> NOAA is an organization that's composed of 72 congregations and other institutions throughout Nashville. And our interest in the mental health question came through our criminal justice task force and our concern about police involvement in mental health issues and finding out that guess what, what's going on here? Basic question. Because it's a medical issue, why are you having law enforcement respond to a medical issue? And members of our congregation ask us this. And members of our congregation, I'll give you one example, call the police because of difficulty with the child who was 12 years old and punching a wall in the house. Came to the police, responded, told the police very clearly, psychiatric issue, this person needs to go to Vanderbilt Psychiatric. They've been treated at Vanderbilt Psychiatric. Police puts the person, the child, in the police car, takes them to Vanderbilt Hospital where they're evaluated and then taken to jail. So this is why we're interested. <laughs> We've seen law enforcement involved in these issues. So we were looking around at different models. And uh, we looked at co-response, we looked at various models, and we looked at the policies and the data that emerged from these models. We, we brought this information to the Police Policy Commission. And the model we brought was CAHOOTS, which was referenced earlier. Briefly, CAHOOTS uh, is in Eugene, Oregon, now expanded to Springfield, Oregon. And when you get a mental health crisis call in Eugene, a CAHOOTS team is sent out. It consists of an EMT and a trained crisis intervention worker. No police. The data show 24,000 calls. Out of 24,000 calls, they only needed to summon the police 175 times out of 24,000. So this is a medical issue, friends, and it needs a medical response. I know everyone here is of goodwill and trying to do the best they can, but the people through NOAA and the communities of Nashville have spoken very clearly about this, and we brought this to the Police Policy Commission. And just want to rewrite that narrative that was presented to you because it wasn't quite accurate. It sounded like the commission all came together and sang kumbaya and said this is the way we want to go. No, there was vigorous dispute and disagreement in the police policy commission. There was a whole committee that recommended the CAHOOTS model. Another committee recommended the co-response model and the mayor's office representative chose the co-response model. Not on the basis of data, but on the basis of the politics in play. We know politics, that's part of what happens, we understand that, but that was not a policy decision by the Policing Commission. That was a political decision that chose one report over another. Now we believe deeply in this because we've lost too many people in mental health crisis situations in Nashville through law enforcement involvement. 
So we don't want to see it unless it's absolutely necessary. And I think Cahoots shows clearly it's not absolutely necessary. 24,000 calls, and you only need to call, summon the police 175 times. I mean, come on. And in Denver, this is another model we looked at that they discussed briefly. The STAR model is the CAHOOTS model, which is, by the way, HEALS. That's our Nashville model of CAHOOTS, the health engagement and liaison support team. The Denver model is doing just what I'm talking to you about, EMT, crisis intervention, no police. <clears throat> so people, they learned in Denver, you don't need the police coming to all these calls. So there is a whole different model out there that we can do. And we, we are really believing as community organizations, and as Arnold pointed out, we're not top down, we're bottom up. We don't want the police responding to these calls, not because police are bad, that's not the issue. It's a medical issue, and it needs a medical response. Now, we had conversations with Chief Drake, Mayor Cooper, and through NOAA, uh, Judge Blackburn, the mental health court judge, we talked to everybody about this model in HEALS, and we've worked hard for it. And frankly, the reason we didn't get it funded through Metro Council was because, once again, some political decisions. But we'll revisit that next year. But the important thing to realize is this. There's an alternative before you go down this road of the co-response model. The uh, HEALS van would show up. It'd be a white van. It'd have a dove of peace on the side. You'd have two individuals getting out, and guess what? No police uniform. Now, I was shocked in the presentation today when the gentleman stood up here and said straightforward to you that a policeman would get out in a uniform in North Nashville. Now, I, I, my office was in North Nashville on Jefferson Street for 13 years. I know this community. I'm a, I'm a member of IMF. I know this community. A police officer would get out of that police vehicle in North Nashville in a mental health crisis call, and that would not, by on its face, escalate the matter. Of course it would escalate the matter. We know what the relationships are here. There is a racial component here. We have to deal with this honestly. It's not just stepping back and working with all our partners throughout Nashville and everything's kumbaya, because it's not. We have honest issues and conflicts here. And what we have to do is meet a community need, not an institutional need, which frankly is what we're embarked on here with the co-response model. It's not a bad model. It's just not one that's not needed for 95% of your calls. You don't need to have police involvement in a mental health issue for 95% of your calls. It's that simple. So <clears throat> we're working on HEALS. We'll continue to present HEALS throughout the community throughout the year. And we talked with Stephen Martini, and he was very forthcoming. His people are not adequately trained to field these 911 calls. They can't identify them properly in terms of mental health. He was really honest about that, and I appreciate that. So clearly, you need to train these people, but I did not hear that in the presentation. Maybe it's going to happen. I hope it does. That needs to happen. And this notion that CIT is somehow adequate in a mental health call could not be further from the truth. That's only 40 hours of training. The CAHOOTS model is 400 hours of training. CIT is woefully inadequate to these kind of calls we're talking about. It was also said that CAHOOTS doesn't respond to major crisis calls. That's simply not true. They respond to every kind of mental health call there is. Now, if there's a gun involved, obviously that's going to be one of the 175 calls where you get the police involved, because nobody wants anyone to be hurt. But by and large, that is not the case. Heels and Cahoots are saying, we deliver medical services for medical problems, and that's what we want to do. Uh, I really want to hear questions from you all, because I could go on and on, and, <laughs> and you've been here long enough already. So, yes, ma'am. What would the fiscal difference, on average, be between the co-response model and the HEALS model? Well, it depends on how you mean fiscal. One of the interesting things about the CAHOOTS model, which we're looking at as our, 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 our goal, is it saves the police millions of dollars every year because you're not involving the police in doing mental health calls. You're involving health professionals. So you're saving, they're saving their budget a significant amount of money every year by keeping it out of law enforcement's hands. So if, 
a program like yours was to be fully funded under public service by Metro Nashville, what what would that estimate be? Like, do you have a sure? We get we have yeah. We work very closely with uh, the chair of the budget committee and other members of council, and I want to give a shout out to them because they were terrific uh, and really supportive of what we're trying to do. So yes, uh, roughly for a year, and it'd be run right around seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Now this is a twenty-four hours. And that was another concern I had. My colleagues are only talking about, as I heard it, 16 hours. Yeah, that's, that's definitely not the way to go. You've got to have 24-hour coverage on this kind of response because mental health doesn't have a time schedule. So basically, that's the answer to your question. Uh, we have, a, by the way, I have a full-blown budget. I'll be happy to send you. As a matter of fact, Sean should have a copy of it, and he can get it to you. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Mr. Goddard. Uh, yes, first I'm going to correct uh, my good friend, Mr. Ringo, on one thing, only because we're being televised and recorded. If I heard the numbers right on Denver, it's over 99% that do not require a police call. It's not 95, it's over 99% that didn't. Excellent. It, it's an extraordinary number. It is. Um, second, if you got the funding, uh, would Heels be able to do what you're describing in Antioch, the third of the three areas that are high calls on this, to have a comparison you, of the two. Yeah, to your budget, what we're, we want to roll the thing throughout the city. That's what that budget you ask about. $775,000, Metro Nashville gets heels. So yes, the entire city. But you, would you be able to run yours simultaneously with the pilot program being done by the city yeah, the to compare the results yes. in, in, in different We'd be areas. happy to. Okay, we, would, that's what well, we would love that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I had. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Mr. Kemmel Gooch. So if I heard you right, you said it would cost $775,000 to do it citywide? Right. Ironically, that's less than what we pay for uh, MMPD for the 64 vacancies that they have on their police officer force right now. Um, which I think is interesting because you mentioned that the that the budget folks helped out really well. It seems like that would be a low ticket item to cover just to make sure that we can do it all the way together. Um, if you can talk about a little bit more about um, the differences between the co response and the heels. I know we talked about uh, police not being involved in the in the heels calls, but if you can go a little bit, if there's a level deeper, you can go. Okay, so you get the call comes into nine one one. It's rooted to heels. The heels response in the van with two people, an EMT and a crisis intervention worker. They come to the, the patient. This is not a suspect. This is, this is a patient, people. <laughs> Please. They come to the patient and evaluate what's going on with the patient and address that patient's need, whether Maybe they need insulin, maybe they need a cigarette, who knows what it is, but evaluate what's going on and have the proper people doing that. So that's what you do. And then once you make that evaluation, you have an action plan. Something has to happen. Whatever that person needs, maybe they need hospitalization in a mental health facility, I don't know. We do have great mental health resources in this town that you can send people to. But that's basically how it works. You start with that. And they make the evaluation, and the person is then sent on. Dr. Kahn. Um, thank you so much for saying. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure I understand. So uh, for this HEALS budget right here, there would be four and a half full-time mental health crisis experts, four and a half emergency medical experts, and then this is the rest of the staff. What is the capacity of this team here? So like how many calls is this team able to do a year or month, well, let's say? That's a very good question. By the way, I really liked your questions earlier. Right oh, so. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a very good question. And, and I can't give you an honest answer because we don't know. And that goes back to the problem that we talked to Mr. Martinez about. We need to take a chunk of money, train these folks properly on the 911 calls. They're good folks. But they've never had, a, had to evaluate mental health calls before. And I appreciate they've got eight more questions, but frankly, there's about 24 more questions I can think of off the top of my head they need to be asking them. So mm -hmm. we need to train them properly. Then once that's done, you can have the, the right response with the HEALS team. So that's how it works. And you have 24-hour response by the HEALS team. Okay. 
if there is any model I can look at just to understand how much staff would be required to be able to have, you know, a 90% sure. response rate, let's say, to a mental health call, that would be. So one of the interesting things is Cahoots is run out of a dental clinic in Oregon. That's what I was going to mention. A dental clinic. <laughs> it's a nonprofit. Yeah. So although it's great to have professionals involved in these things, and obviously we have great professionals in this town, it can be run out of a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that gets you a budget like I talked to you earlier about the 775000 And now I lost the theme of your question, so give it to me again. Oh, I'm just yeah curious. I mean, for cahoots, like how much staff do they have, and then right. how many are they able to? So Google, Google the Whiteberg Clinic, B I R D, Eugene, Oregon, and they have a thread there for a, a, a link to cahoots. Okay. All you want to know about cahoots will be right there. Whiteberg Clinic, Eugene, Oregon. And then, sorry, just to make sure I understand. Like in the ideal situation, would there also be a a, a place for? if police were out and they wanted to instead bring y'all in because they say, okay, this is actually not, you know, doesn't need us. We, we, we want then why are you there? Well, I mean, that's, that's the current situation, right? It's yeah, us. but that's so, what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Yeah. We don't want that situation. Right. Because other things can happen too. Yeah. So no, that, it's not the police respond first. It's the mental health people who respond first. Right. Oh. And as we saw recently and tragically, <coughs> at the SWAT team showed up when the person was killed having that schizophrenic attack, mm -hmm. and there was mental health people there, but mental health people didn't run that show. Yeah. So that's what happens. That, that again, it's a medical issue, oh, and it needs a medical response. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hayes. And I appreciate, Joe, you mentioned about uh, 24K, you know, incidents in 175 where right. they had to call officers. And I can see uh, people <coughs> giving pushback as to uh, the safety of the medical professionals. Uh, do you have any data on whether, like the Denver, uh, the Denver, or you said the Oregon model, <laughs> sure. if there were incidents where, uh, now, keep in mind that sometime, unfortunately, officers get injured also. Sure. But I could see where somebody pushing back hard saying, well, hey, an officer was there, this person wouldn't have got injured. So do you have any data or anywhere you could probably get that? Okay, part, I'm gonna be honest with you. Part of the engine that's pushing this co-response model is that concern. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mentioned today, but that's part of it. And frankly, I understand it, but it's not shown in the data. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. there was a, a two years ago now, I think, in Memphis, a mental health worker who was killed in responding yeah, to a situation. A so the mental health people feel that profoundly, and I understand that. But by you don't design a whole mental health policy around one incident. Right. You look at, like they did in Eugene, how many calls you had, what were they for and how many times you had to summon the police, then you say, oh, we've got a policy. You don't do it on the basis of one incident that happened in right. Memphis. Right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brown had a question, but he just stepped out for a moment. Um, if no one else has any more questions, I, I'll ask, have you explored private funding for setting up a nonprofit? to be able to do this or to maybe leverage private funds to get the city to cover the rest? It's my belief that this is what the people of Nashville want. And it's not just my opinion. It's We've had community meetings across the city. And I really believe if we had had cooperation from certain parties in the budget process, this would have been funded at this point. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a need to go to private funding. I think. There's a real desire to see the HEALS program in Nashville, and I think next year we will be able to discuss it with Metro Council and obtain funding for it along the lines that, that I mentioned. Mr. Kamaluch. Yeah, and I just wanted to give a response to that as well as somebody who administers a, a, a street-based mediation program in my nine to five. These programs are popping up all across the country and they do not involve any, uh, police. Mm -hmm. So I think that, 
I think once again we're 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 in danger as Nashvilleians of being left behind um, what's best practices in other cities, and it feels like it feels like there's already been a, a decision made that the pilot is going to grow no matter what the what the um, no matter what the data says. So I think I mean I'm a little alarmed that we seem to be all in on something. That uh, I mean, Denver itself, the one that they talk about, has moved on from from having police respond to calls. So, I just wanted to leave that comment here: is that it's not unusual for police not to be involved in these things. Just like it's not unusual for police not to be involved in traffic stops, right? Um, so I just I, the presentation before made it seem uh, as a community member mm -hmm. that. That the dan that that the that the people that are struggling with mental illness are the danger, mm -hmm. right? When we know that the danger is coming from the response, um, and so I just wanted to I just wanted to state that here, because I know we just went through a long, arduous presentation of what felt like to me felt like a doubling down on um, the institution that has historically harmed us. So. I just wanted to leave that comment here. Well, if, if I may follow up, because I, I, I'm sitting out here listening to this presentation, I was shocked right. when they talked about a policeman getting out of a marked car. I asked Chief Drake in our conversation, I said, Chief Drake, you know what happens when a policeman gets out of a marked car in North Nashville? It escalates the situation. He says, no. They won't be a marked car, and he won't have on a uniform. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the story has changed in six weeks. So, uh, again, these are good people, and they're, we're all trying to respond to a mental health crisis. But I think what we have run into in NOAA, and I'm just being really honest with you about this, because this is an ongoing issue that's going to culminate next June. You have institutions in play that are good folks, but they're running institutions and they want to expand. If you're running the police, you want more policemen. If you're running the mental health co-op, you want more people to work for the mental health co-op. That, that's just part of institutions. That's what they do. What we're saying is we need to step back as a community, look at what our needs are, and consider other options that might best fit our needs. And that's what we think HEALS does. It's a medical response to a medical problem. There are no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Ingle. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So it's 530, and we still have a couple things to get through the agenda. So I'm going to try to be as uh, quick as possible with um, some things I had to speak about. Um, first, our retreat that's planned for July 10th. Um, again, that's going to be half a day in the morning to the afternoon. That's going to include breakfast and lunch. Um, it's going to be at the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition's new headquarters, and that's at 3310 Izell Road. Um, as a facilitator for the retreat, I've um, secured Dr. Smallwood, um, Associate D Director for Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. And we'll have Andrea Blackman as a speaker. She is uh, Chief Equity and Diverse, Chief Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for Metro, um, hoping that she can speak on the history of policing and civil rights in Nashville to um, give us some context uh, as we go into our discussion there. Um, you will be receiving all of that information before the 10th. Um, so if you have any questions there, um, you can ask now. If not, I'll move on to the next thing. Starts what time again? To be decided, but okay. probably like 8.45. Okay. Breakfast. Um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, these are all things too that we discussed at the executive committee meeting on Monday. Um, we also looked at MNPD's response to our uh, PRR, if 
it was part of the materials that had been sent over, and I know Director Fitchard had sent it earlier. Um, we found a lot of deficiencies in the response and wanted to bring them up to the board to consider what our response to be, or what our response should be to this response. Um, first, I'm going to point some out. Um, their response to recommendation number one. Um, so this is on page two. Um, it's they they say that in order to determine the most appropriate finding, further investigation is required. So again, that. Um, they say that the allegation that we sent over was unfounded, but did find that um, the officer went to the juvenile's residence without a representative from the juvenile court, which I understand is against policy, mm -hmm. um, but do not address how they would um, deal with that policy violation, um, and they leave it open. Um, using passive voice, as Mr. Goddard pointed out, um, which isn't, isn't clear and um, we should have clarity on how the police department is going to further and investigate that if they are or if they're asking us to investigate it. Um, and if they have found a policy violation, what discipline is required uh, or should be given here. Um, Another part on the response is the fact that they mention when we ask that they institute a policy for uh, requiring a signature f for consent to search, um, they indicate that body-worn cameras will uh, make signatures um, Irrelevant, um, which we found not not to be a good response. Um, for one, while the body camera will show that you know no one was necessarily told to say yes, um, there's something that the body worn camera is not capturing, and it's maybe the presence of four big policemen in front of you asking you a question, and you being too scared to say no. Um, so we need to, you know, bring that point up in our response to them. Um, and another part, they, and this is going to the daily activity sheets that, uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch mentioned earlier. Um, the investigation that we conducted found that the officers were not, uh, filling out their daily activity sheets, um, and the police department's response, uh, was that um, just because the uh, daily activity sheets were not found, that's not totally conclusive. An activity sheet or group of activity sheets could be lost. Are they admitting to regularly losing daily activity sheets? It's not clear here. Um, are they using this as an excuse? That's not clear either. Um, additionally, they say the department is in process of creating a tool where <coughs> MNPD supervisors can download an activity report from RMS if and when one is needed. When functional, this would remove the need for an officer to complete a daily activity sheet. Um, that is not an adequate response to policy violations that are recurring right now. Just because there's going to be a tool in the future that may remove the need to have these there's a current policy in place that requires officers to fill out these daily activity sheets, and it seems like that's not happening for at least the officers that uh, we looked into. And I believe there were there was no daily activity sheets for a month. That right? We didn't know. They didn't have any for that particular time. Right. Um, so obviously that needs addressing. Um, that we can 
go about that in a letter or I want to hear any responses that uh, other board members have after having considered this response. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I just want to mention how wild this mug read. That's why I want to mention the tone of the, like, I read it again last night, and just the tone of the language throughout this is just so, what's the word? Dismissive. Dismissive and adversarial as well, too. Yeah. Like, you know, like we're not working towards the same goal. So, yeah, I'm also curious on what other people read, too, but I just wanted to mention that first. It's not just the, the dismissal, but it's like the tone of, like, y'all don't know nothing or something. And also the reference to the policing commission, which was, I think the, I think they reference it here. And I'm starting to notice a pattern that every single time we talk about the community oversight board or recommendation, they seem to throw the ball to the policing commission, which, and then they conveniently leave out that it was police officers involved uh, in that commission as well. So I wanted to mention those two things. Thank you, Mr. Gambovich. Yes, one thing that I didn't mention was the tone it seemed like they weren't coming to the table in good faith um, which shouldn't be the case here dr. Kong um, I had raised some of this in the executive meeting but there's just a couple points I wanted to raise here and I, I echo everything that mr. Campbell Gooch just said and also um, just would love for letter or response to highlight that body-worn cameras are not a silver bullet um, there is a lot of extra tape that they produce it requires them to be actually on uh, and, uh, and I remember uh, Executive Director Fitcher raised great points and, you know, if this is happening at 4 in the morning, uh, you know, a person might not be properly dressed and they don't want the camera on, et cetera. And so just making it really clear that this doesn't actually address a lot of the issues that we laid out. Um, and also um, would just love for us to be able to compile some information around states that do require written consent and are doing that and have a process for that um, as a requirement, not as a suggestion. Um, it, it is possible, and so I think making that really clear that that consent can be achieved. Um, and I have other thoughts about around it, did, did those actual one day suspensions for the, the for the um, not filling out the action sheet da daily action sheets actually happen? I'd love to have a follow up on that. Thank you, Dr. Kong. Um, Mr. Goddard. I, I would hope on this or in any future reports we send over like that, the first question should be, was policy violated? And if we cited the wrong specific section, we should have cited something else, that, fine to point out. But to answer the question, was policy violated? Mm -hmm. If it's not clear and more investigation needs to be done, mm -hmm. say that and say whether the police department's going to do it, which is fine, mm -hmm. or whether they want us to do it, which is fine, if they give us the documents and the access to people, we need to do that. Either of those is fine. And at the end of the investigation, whether you have to have some more or not, if policy was violated, what is the appropriate punishment? And that's, that's not what this letter was. Mm -hmm. it, it was obfuscatory with respect to that, if that's a word, I think it is. Um, <laughs> and it just wasn't clear at all. And I'm, I'm hoping this is an initial misstep on, on this series of reports and we can work towards those kinds of goals together and get to where we communicate together. If we, if we see that differently and don't think that's a good process, we need to sit down and talk about that with the police. But if, if we're on the same page there, there's a better way to communicate that, I believe, one person's opinion. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Um, Mr. Wynn. Yeah, I had a, um, a statement first about the activity sheets. Now, I haven't, I haven't been there 20 years, so let's just put that in this right frame first. Mm -hmm. um, losing activity sheets at my time there was not unusual, but um, if you're filling out your activity sheet after each call, you're documenting your time on call, the time you've left, what you did. Right. So that's part of the process that you go through after you finish, that's your return disposition on call. You've got to do that. So you're documenting your work. You can't do it at the end of the shift. You have to do it right away. So if an officer's losing their activity sheet, that's the supervisor's problem to fix immediately. Mm -hmm. So it then turn into something where something big happens, all of a sudden the officer's got no proof of what they did on the call. Uh, and then, are you saying that there was 30 days of no activity? So yeah, let me just explain. Yeah, that, that was a little. There was, this was over multiple months, from June until September. 
um, an officer had checked himself out at the at the residence multiple times, but the complainant said that the officers had come between that time where there was no documentation to prove whether the officer was there or not. So for multiple months, there was no activity sheets from those officers at all. For, for the entire shift or just for these moments where they were searching for this one suspect? For the time frames that she gave us, okay. that there, was, there were no activity sheets. Okay. So she said he came, they came in August multiple times. They said they didn't, right. but there's no activity sheets to show one way or the other. For the whole month so, of August? For the month of August. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, that sounds odd. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and the other thing is, consensual search forms are generally signed for evidence, so it won't be challenged in court. People give consent to search all the time. It's unusual that they're asking for a consensual search of a person, and I never got a clear idea of what, why they were back there again and again and again looking for this young man. Was he a suspect in an ongoing criminal okay. enterprise or it's what? It's a juvenile that lived, he resided with his grandmother in, how, in, in Edge Hill Housing and had been um, initially charged with having some friends and some guns at the, at the, at the apartment. Um, he was, uh, his case was dismissed mm -hmm. and he was placed on some juvenile probation for something else that I guess occurred at that same time. And it, so there was an allegation that um, they continued to come by and check on the child and um, that they felt that that was the need, they needed to do that um, because he was on probation, um, which is not the duty of a police officer to do that. Right. And so as we tried to contact the probation officer, um, the probation officer gave us as much information as she could and then, you know, kind of didn't want to get involved in it and, you know, but, so basically, that was what the officer's claim was, that they were making certain that that child was following their probation. So, so it, then it's un, it, for me, when I read this, it sort of stood out as unusual that unless this officer is in the warrant division or he's working on some task force or he's a... It's a part of a task force, juvenile task, task force. force. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that might explain some of it. But is that routine for this task force to do knock and talks and check on people regularly? Is that something that they do now? They have time for that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that, I don't have an answer for that. Supposed to. Okay. All right. Now I just there, there was there was some blanks left in this that didn't quite make a lot of a lot of sense to me. Is um, so I just right. The, most of the information that I gathered was from our investigation, which if you wanted to look at the investigation no, summary, no, I, no, I, but I'm just saying in general, that is right. where all this information was, and that information was sent over to the police yeah. department. They requested it, actually, the entire file. Mm -hmm. So they got all the exhibits, all the investigations, all mm -hmm. the witnesses' uh, right. statements, and they had the entire file. Right. So generally when there's a problem like this, the supervisor takes some responsibility as well. That's what supervisors are supposed to do. <laughs> they're, they're accountable for their officers' problems, misconduct, or training, and discipline, and and all all the rest of that. So that that's just it seemed kind of odd. Who who was this immediate supervisor of this officer, and were they checking daily for the daily? That's why it's called daily activity sheets. Mm -hmm. Why they were missing, and now it becomes a problem with this call. So it's just my you know, observations about it. So. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. I have Mr. Hayes, Mr. Campbell Gooch, and then Mr. Holloway. I just want to say that uh, when, I, when I saw this, I was very disappointed in the response. Uh, I said, you know, with an MOU, this is definitely not in the spirit of cooperation. Uh, also, uh, this person decided to file a complaint, and this type of response it's very discouraging for anyone to want to come up and file a complaint. It does not, it does not help with that. It does not really go anywhere about building trust between the community and, and MMPD. Uh, and also, data was missing from the police department, but it sounds like the person that filed a complaint, she did 
indicate that they had been there. But, you know, it looks like this just ignored, it ignored that person's word and then went with the police's word and they had no data to back it up. Mm -hmm. Also, in addition to that, when I think about best practices, uh, we hear it all the time about how great MMPD is and not turn in sheets like that and for an extended period of time. I know there may be some cases where you may miss some sheets or whatever, but there's no excuse. This is, that is definitely not best practices. It's not. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Oh, I think it's Mr. Holloway. Oh. Okay, in the first place, <clears throat> they got a device on the vehicle called AVL. And it will locate you wherever you go. If he said he stopped at this location, all they got to do is pull it up on the machine to find out of, uh, what his, what the location was and what time. They did with me. They said, well, what are you doing down here? I, I said, well, I'm in court. I got some pen here. I can't come to court, you know. So the, those uh, they are pretty accurate. We used to have the tachograph, you know, with a little device in the back. <laughs> they got slick with that. We had a guy to put one on top of a record jack and just let the wheel go round and round, you know. So and one guy decided to take an ink pen and start making some models and that that didn't work. So we had to get they had to get a little bit slick. But they got an AVL. Mm -hmm. If if that AVL is not working, you park that car. You don't use it. Mm -hmm. Right. We did request the AVL records mm -hmm. and they weren't available. Well somebody it's needs to get suspended. <laughs> <laughs> Which Thank you, Mr. Holloway, for bringing that up. That's also something that we discussed in in the executive committee meeting, Mr. Kemal Gooch. Yeah, I just want to mention uh, the when we when we had this conversation, uh, the voice that keeps going off on my head is is uh, Holloway, and the reason why is because I think on here and I can't find the response. There's one response that says, "Well, the the penalty actually for this is one day." Mm -hmm. On page four. Suspended. Yeah. One day suspension, and I remember uh, Holloway being like. We should take a vacation day, or there was some there was some suggestion on discipline. So I keep hearing that voice in my head. Also, I think if uh, hindsight being twenty twenty, knowing that it is the supervisor's responsibility to make sure that those right. daily activity sheets are uh, mm -hmm. filled out, I think in these type of cases when we do have missing records, I do think it makes sense to offer uh, some sort of discipline for the command structure structure if, I, if I'm saying that right I'm not sure if I am well if we have a missing record like the daily activity sheet um, and then the AVL is not also available to us whoever the responsibility of getting the a uh, the daily sheet done should be also penalized in this situation as well because that limits the effectiveness of the investigation I also want to mention since um, and, and I mentioned this in the executive committee, and this is kind of like another time where I think we're experiencing a hole in the MOU, um, especially around the AVL data, to where we can strengthen the MOU by naming that we should have access to that in certain situations or in situations. So I do want to suggest, and I know Dr. Hildreth isn't here, who is the one who did the negotiations with the MOU that we seriously consider as a board revisiting the MOU and tighten it up in places that we're seeing kind of loose right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Any other? Oh, I did. Oh. I did have one more. Um, I know last time we was together, we talked about that we had several of these um, investigations coming up that were that were wrapping. Um, Executive Director, can you talk about what's happening with those cases in coordination with these? Yeah, sure. So we had multiple unlawful search um, complaints. And so I felt that the best way to move forward was to wait until we had, since we've got a response for this one. Um, and I didn't want to continue the investigation in those. The investigation has been completed, but move, move forward on my end until we resolve this issue, um, because it doesn't make sense to get the same response continuously. And so I think it's important that we do send a letter, address it, um, because I think we have uh, more than two unlawful searches. 
um, so that we can get the right language, that we can get the right response. We know where we are with that. Um, now, you know, whether or not those cases will be sustained or not sustained, I think that what, what happens here is, you know, we want to get these things moving forward. We are, we, like I said before, when we were in the last meeting, we have a backlog um, and we want to just move forward on our complaints, but we want to go through this process and know how um, we're going to, how our responses are going to be. There's no use of me pushing out five or six and we're going through those and, you know, the police department is like, this is not correct or it doesn't fall in line with our rules and regulations. I think that some of this will be resolved when we hire a lead um, legal advisor um, who can sift through what the rules are um, because it's very hard to go through the police department's um, discipline grid and apply it and make certain that we're doing it right. It's not necessarily written for the public, it's written for police officers. Um, and so I think it's gonna be best, and hopefully we'll have a legal advisor, I'll talk about that soon, um, hired pretty soon that can go through this, has some knowledge of the civil service process or knowledge of the, um, you know, how to work within the police department's rules and regulations. So um, that's where we are with that if I answered your question, Mr. Booth. You did. Uh, it's a follow-up question. Um, well, a fo two follow-up inquiries, uh, and this is both for board members and the staff, uh, because I feel like if we, since we're backlogged and, and we kind of paused by this, which we've been paused before, <laughs> folks, folks, we've been paused before because of records requests, uh, and I remember the reaction to that being like very urgent because we had to get it going. Um, so I'm just thinking through both what is city council's responsibility in making sure that we can get this settled so we can deliver the rest of those reports and then two what are what are some actions we can take as a board I know we mentioned the letter writing what are some actions we can take as a board to kind of get this ball rolling because if we have multiple of these waiting I mean, I just I don't like the optics of having those things just kind of up in the air yeah, and I, I want to say something too. We've been out. We've been without an investigator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've lost an investigator in August mm -hmm. of last year. So we're we're depending on two people mm -hmm. and A.D. Mm -hmm. Clausey to get through all of these investigations. So I, you know, I know it's not that the budget just passed, but you know, as we continue, especially since the pandemic is over, we are at over thirty complaints in the mid in June. Right. Right. We're right. in June. Whereas last year, that was the whole year, right? We're going to have to have more staff so that we can yeah, get these on. things knocked yeah. out, addressed, and put before the board within a reasonable amount of time. You can't expect us to get 100 uh, uh, complaints and only have two people, three people doing that. It's just not, it's not feasible. It's not best practice either. And that's why you have other cities that have multiple investigators. Mm -hmm. And so it will be something that we're addressing. We are, we, we have had um, some inquiry into that from other um, cities on how, you know, are we, you know, able to um, get our complaint process done in a timely fashion. We have a 60 day limit. We want to be able to meet that, that 60, 60 days and we have to be equipped sure in order for us to be able to be effective in that way. Yeah, I, uh, and this is my last, I'm gonna shut up. But uh, that feels like that might be a role, especially as our city, and I think I was at one budget here where they were mentioning that we had a couple leftover dollars from uh, CARES Act money and a couple of dollars from the American Rescue Plan. I even think the co-response model that we looked at, I think it mentions the American Rescue Plan. So, mm -hmm. it might be a it might be a circumstance to where that might be the role, the, the the action that City Council can take, is getting us more investigators, so that we can get this backlog. And also, there's several. I mean, we just heard it today. There's conversations happening about expanding MMPD. So naturally, the oversight board is going to expand because we're going to have to assume that there's going to be more complaints because there's literally more officers on the board. Uh, but yeah. And I want to say, Mr. Hayes, you know, he, he mentioned in the executive committee meeting that when they initially started the Community Oversight Board, they built into the budget mm -hmm. increase in staff. Mm -hmm. At this point, no one's addressed it or talked about it. Mm -hmm. 
and it's something that we need to address at some point. It may not be today, but it is something, you know, as, as we move forward, especially if you're adding a ninth precinct, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to like, I don't want to knock on wood that we don't get any more complaints, but <laughs> the likelihood that that's going to happen is high. Right. And so we have to think about that in order for us, you know, to get the work done in a timely fashion, we have to have the staff to do it. Because investi I, I'm not real comfortable just throwing an investigation together and it's done haphazardly. Right. You know, that's not the way that we work. We like to work in excellence. We want to be thorough. And I think that that's where we, ha we have been that. The ones that I've looked at, the things that might need extra stuff, I send it back. Let's get that done. So we're, n we're not just going to, I'm not comfortable just putting out a bunch of investigations and they're all incomplete. So. <clears throat> Mr. Holloway. Um, I believe that um, this investigation on this um, these activity sheet, uh, the program, it, it it appears that you're gonna have to go through the chain of command. You know, start at the top and work down to the bottom because it is a situation where too much time has elapsed and no recording of it, and so somebody's job is on the line. Now either you get fired <laughs> or, or, or I'm gonna get fired. And I'm gonna take care of my home, and I'm not gonna let you take care of my home. Come on. So we you put the pressure on uh, through that change of command, mm -hmm. and then you make sure you publicize in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Any other discussion on that? Um, so I hear what we can at least do right now is send a letter <coughs> that I would write. Do we need to vote on that? If so, I'll take a motion. I'm sorry, you're looking that way and I can't sorry. hear you. <laughs> what we can do immediately is write a letter in response. So if we want to go that route, then I'll, do we need a vote from the board? If we do, I'll take a motion for that. You do need a vote from the board if you want it to be from the board. If you wanted to draft it as the chair, you don't need a vote for that. So that's okay. kind of the two ways to do it. I would prefer it have the authority of the full board mm -hmm. and yeah. move that the uh, the chair of the board be authorized to draft and send a letter uh, in response to this report back from the chief and encourage him to work with the executive director in drafting that. I second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Any focused discussion? There's none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, it's six o'clock, but we still have some things to get over. So um, another thing that we discussed in the executive committee meeting is uh, something that I'd been working on for a while too, and that is um, a salary increase for our executive director, Director Fitchard. Um, it came to my attention that when she was uh, hired, she wasn't getting paid what the previous executive director was getting paid and I didn't think that fair. Um, so at a minimum, we want to make up, I thought we should make up that gap. Um, plus, um, you know, increases in salary that that original salary would have had. Um, and also I know how hard Director Fitchard works. We're on the phone every day <laughs> um, so I really wanted to bring that up the executive committee voted to increase her salary 15% which as a board we have the authority to increase um, the executive director's salary from 0 to 15% um, and Mr. Clausey assistant director Clausey has a little bit more information on that if um, you want to say anything on that we were talking, so yeah. I, missed, I missed what you, what you had said. What did you say? I'm sorry. So um, just if you wanted to provide a little bit more background sure. on the, the, the salary and uh, the increases. So I know that um, speaking with HR, that there's a range for the directors in these positions between 0 to 15% of an increase. Um, figuring that in and what the mayor's budget had prepared for us uh, to have for that increase, um, we, we have 
without going into a long story, we have enough in our budget to support it. I've checked with our finance people. We do have enough in our budget to support anywhere from obviously zero to 15%. So I did want to get that number in case you all decided. So anywhere in between or at the top, we, we can support that. Does that help? Yes. Uh, Mr. Holloway. Uh, when she first took over the position, and um, matter of fact, I talked about the salary, and she didn't want me to say nothing. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think it's fair. <laughs> Do the same work as somebody else and not get paid for. No, that's exactly right. I agree. So we need to do what's right. right. That's right. No, you're right. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mm -hmm. Mr. Campbell. -Sitch. Yeah, I also want to mention that um, I know for a fact that we have been struggling through this, mm -hmm. and I know the majority of that struggle usually falls on uh, the executive director. Um, to manage all the movement part. And I know that we, there's no possible way that uh, we could compensate actually for the actual amount of hours um, that is being put in here. I think we had, we had in our last report, it said we met two times more than city council last year when, when you included all of the subcommittee meetings and all of that. So I wish that we could honestly give a raise above 15%, right? Because I'm like, yo, anybody who is willing to stick with this and go over all of the hurdles um, that come with it, I think should be duly compensated and should not have to worry about anything else. Thank you, Mr. Campbell-Gooch. I will take a motion to um, increase the salary if the board chooses to go that route. Effective. When would it be effective? Every uh, the, the, is it July one. July one. Yes, we are effective. Move increase it by fifteen percent effective July one. A second. Any focus discussion? Does that include the raises? Okay. <clears throat> um, Mr. Witzel's question is: Does that include um, the raises? So, you know, starting what Mr. Whedon's salary was, does it include the raises that that would have had the that he would have had it up to this point? It does. Yeah. It actually is is a little above. If he would have gotten at this cycle, if he would have gotten just the bare minimum, so it it would be. Any other questions? Any focus discussion? If not, um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Thank you. Then with that, I'll pass it on to you for your executive director's report. First, I want to say thank you all. Um, it has been a tremendous opportunity for me to lead this board and, and our staff. And so I'm very honored and humbled by all that you have said. And so I hope that I'm leading with integrity, and I hope that I'm doing the work that you want me to do, and that I'm presenting in the work that we do to the community in such a way that they understand that we care, that we're trying to really move forward in this city to heal and have better relationships between our community and our police department because it makes for us as a better, stronger Nashville overall. And that's what we all want. That's why we're all here. And so I thank you all and appreciate this, what you all had to say. I'm a little, <coughs> that makes me a little uncomfortable, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. As for the executive director's report, I won't take up a whole lot of time in that. Um, the MNCO office, we have decided to move forward and going back to the office full time on July 1st. And so everyone has been notified of that. And of course, we will adhere to what the Metro has um, stated for us in regards to um, procedures and protocols regarding COVID. So. Um, that will be on a Thursday, of course, and then there's a three-day weekend because of the 4th of July, but everyone's going to be back in the office. We have a personnel update, so we have hired an investigator. That person will start on July 6th. Um, we have, we're, we interviewed three people. Um, on, that was the second interview for the people for the legal advisor position, mm -hmm. and we have honed it down to a couple people, and so we'll make a decision on that coming up. I think that all of the applicants 
brought tremendous amount of knowledge. And so, it, you know, picking, it's a hard choice to pick who we want to be our legal advisor, but we're going to pick the best person that can lead us forward um, in the years to come and help us with our foundational things that we have and to get that backlog out the way. And so I, we will have an analyst, um, we, I'm sorry, we have the analyst vacancy is open as well. Um, we start that process next week where we are going to interview, I think it was 13 people, but I think they're going to hone it down to six or seven people. Um, and that will that process. We've had some turnover in our office, and so it's been challenging. Um, and then we just received a um, notice um, from one of our employees at Community Liaison. Um, we'll be moving on to another city, and so that will be vacated. That position will be vacated on July the 6th. And so we'll be looking for a Community Liaison to take over that position. Um, we've had multiple trainings, um, webinars through NACO. We attended one called Role of the First Line Supervisor in Facilitating Change in Law Enforcement Organizations, and it was wonderful. Um, it was really good to hear from um, people who have done this work and have tried to connect with law enforcement. Actually, she was an expert in this field, and so if you are interested, I can send you the information for that. The 27th annual NACO conference is going to start. Um, if you all are interested, let me know so that we can get you registered. Um, it's two components this year. They're going to have a virtual one, and as well as they're going to have a in-person, and it's in um, December instead of October like it normally is. Or, so it's going to be December the 12th to the 16th. It's going to be in Tucson, Arizona. and. I will say that the one that we went to in Detroit was fabulous. It was just great information. They had experts from all across the country, those who had knowledge of policing, police chiefs. Uh, we just had a tremendous time of networking with other professionals who were doing police accountability work. And so if you can at least take the webinars, the virtual training, I think it would be beneficial to you as a board. Um, but if you are interested in taking the, uh, I think the last time Miss Ross went, so we had availability for one person, I think that we'll still be able to fund that. So let me know who's interested in that. Oh, yeah. Sure. Would it be possible to attend if you pay your own if that one spot is taken? Like, yeah, you pay absolutely. Okay. You can definitely do that. And you can still register for both if you want. Um, but I think that our staff likes the in-persons. It's just really good to network sure. with other people yeah. who are doing this work across, this, across the states. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, there's people that come in from other, from other um, countries. I think we had someone from Ireland there. It was just, one, it was just a, a really good time to, and to ask the questions that we can't get answers to on the phone sometimes. So. Um, we continue with our community outreach. I attended the Parkwood Communities Home Association meeting, and it was really good. There were officers there, and the commander from the Madison Precinct was there, too, talking about the Parkwood um, neighborhood um, and, the, and some of the issues that they're having with um, a particular, um, I guess, an area in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But overall, just sharing what the COB does with, the, with that community, a lot of people weren't aware, and so it was really good to be able to network with them. Um, myself and Dr. Valier participated in the Juneteenth activities, set up a booth, and um, actually um, there was a lot of um, people that came through and took our information and will connect with us, so that's really good. Um, the complaint process, we've received six investigative complaints since our last board meeting in May. Um, we've requested and received three sets of records from MMPD, so that process is going really well. Um, and we have had six non-complaint calls for service as of June 18th. And so as for the body-worn camera update, it looks like the West Precinct, East, North, Madison, Midtown Hills, Central, field training officers, the Titans teams, the training division instructors, the special response teams, the K-9 units, the MDHA task force, and the Office of Community Outreach and Partnerships have all been outfitted. Um, this report says that by July 13th, all precincts will be equipped with body-worn cameras, and by July 30th, all precincts will have in-car cameras. And so it looks like to date there is 1,032 of 1,417, 1,417 active employees equipped with body-worn cameras. That's 73%. 
and at 556 of 718 vehicles have been equipped with in-car cameras, and that's 77%. And um, going on to the Citizens Police Academy, I just wanted to congratulate those who attended the academy and, you know, and graduated. <coughs> I don't see anybody with their little um, certificate and badges on, but, you know, <laughs> I think it was five members. And I just want to say thank you for attending that and completing that. Um, it's important that you complete that. So those of you who haven't completed it, there will be a session in the fall. It's required. It's mandatory, actually. So just let me know, and I'll get you signed up um, when they make that notification. You, you don't have the dates yet? I don't have the dates yet. They haven't given me those. Um, and there is some board member training that HR, and I think I've mentioned this t a couple of times, if you haven't signed up for the sexual harassment prevention and diversity and inclusion training, let me know so I can get you signed up. The last session for this um, fiscal year is June 30th. It's a requirement, so if you haven't got in, you need to get in that class. It's June 30th at 10 a.m. It's done virtually. It takes a I don't know, maybe an hour, two hour. hours? Like yeah. an hour. It was an like hour. A, about an hour, an okay. Hour. Um, Chair Martinez already mentioned the retreat. I'm looking forward to that. I think this is a time that we can come together and get to know each other on a more personal level. Since we, you know, don't, at least you guys don't get to talk to one another. I do talk to you all sometimes. But it's really, I think it's important. We haven't had a retreat before. I think this will, and this will be our first retreat. But it's something that we should do more often. I think that as a board, and we're not going to be discussing board business. We're just going to be talking about personal stuff um, and have some, ex, ex, some trainings, of course. Um, but it's important that we continue to do that. This work is hard work. Um, justice work isn't easy. Um, and so we want to make certain that we are addressing whatever needs that you have. I'm addressing those needs and that we collectively get to know one another on a more personal level. So the budget process is complete. Um, we were fully funded for the fiscal year 22. Our staff received COLA and merit raises and increases, which will take effect on July 1st. And as the community continues to bring forward complaints of police misconduct and our research of policing issues broaden, we will definitely need more staff to assist in the growth of our department. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, on the budget, what, what I take, I, looking through it, I didn't see that there was any request for additional investigator this year. We're, you're never going to get anything unless you ask for it. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're going to we're going to ask for it. We wanted to get some data behind it first to support our request, and so that's being worked on now, so that we will ask for them in the next fiscal year. Yeah, because yeah, obviously the problem with investigations that take a year or so to get a report out or longer are. They're more difficult to answer. The records are gone. Memories are gone, and so it's critical to get to get those reports out as as expeditiously as you can. But you don't want to you don't want to have a, a sloppy report. You right. want to have it absolutely. But the longer it waits, generally age doesn't improve things. Right. I agree with you on that, and I think that I think that having a legal advisor initially, just so that everyone knows, initially how the process was is that. We have our investigators do it, and then I would do it alone, right? One person trying to do multiple investigation <laughs> proposed resolution reports. I was a little apprehensive about letting someone take over that process because I was like, no, I want, you know, I have a particular way I want those done. But I think that um, having a legal advisor to make certain that what, what we're producing is legally sound as well as follows the rules of the civil service is going to be the best route for us. And then we, the both of us will be able to work on those together so that we can pr get them out faster um, and, and, and really just get through our backlog. We're not even talking about the ones that we're, you know, still are trying to meet our 60-day goal. But I think that having the right person in that role, we should be able to do that. Yeah, and I guess one comment on the, we spent a lot of time tonight talking on the uh, report and the police response, and uh, I was a little disappointed in the police response. That I thought it was a a little bit uh, negative. Uh, I thought, our, but I thought our our question. You and I have discussed this. Mm -hmm. I thought part of our our thing. Uh, we had some problems, I think, with our own report, and the idea that. The, that we require, we want them to require 
a consent form before a search is made is, I think, causes serious problems. And uh, one is it's not constitutionally required. And second is there's an unintended consequence of that. If you go, police think they have need read to search and they ask for consent and it's refused, the police, and I've had a couple of cases of this where lawsuits have been filed over, but the police, uh, if they have probable cause, have a right to essentially enter the property, do a quick sweep, and wait then before searching for the warrant. And so sometimes you can end up with a lot of police there at the house holding it till they get a warrant. So to say they have to get a warrant uh, could in some cases cause problem, cause individuals a lot more problem with the police there waiting for a warrant. So I, I think there's some I think there's some serious problems with our recommendation that that uh, we have uh, we require that that they require it, and I think that may have kind of triggered the police being a a little bit snippy in their in their response. But I would hate to see us to get into who shot John and back and forth and you know sometimes I see things that just escalate as we go along so I hope in our response we don't we don't over escalate in response to the to the police department they raise some points and uh, I think it certainly need to be addressed but I, I would be careful that we don't we don't escalate it further because we're going to have to work with them uh, and uh, I just think that there needs to be a little more conversation there because I didn't I would, didn't particularly appreciate their response, but on the other hand, uh, I could see some of their points. Can I make a quick comment? Um, and all due respect, Judge Brown, I, uh, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. I just I think one the, the tone of that letter. I mean, it just really was not operating in good faith. At least it came off to me in that way. And uh, and I was thinking about this after our meeting on Monday and. Um, and I've done a lot of work and in, in research and getting consent from people just to get a survey, right? Just to like a simple survey question. It's, it's harder to get informed written consent for that process than it is to me seemingly to enter someone's home. Uh, which to me, I, I don't know, there's just, uh, I guess there can be all of these sort of like if, ands, and what's up for what the process can look like. But like I said, I mean, uh, if you do a quick Google search, other cities have figured out how to do it. And uh, I think it's been brought up multiple times when it comes to process, uh, Nashville's falling behind uh, in multiple ways, and especially within the police department. And so I, you know, I, I support what was written in that letter and uh, or written into that response. And I, I think you know, definitely we wanna make sure we're collaborating, but I don't think that means that we have to water down what we're saying, especially if it's been proven to work uh, in other settings. Thank you. And I'd like to add that I did, you know, I think it came up in our executive committee meeting, and, and in all due respect, um, Judge Brown, I did some research on what other cities had um, who have warrantless searches. And uh, Dr. Valier, do you have that information with you? You want to talk about it? Sure. I had Dr. Valier check into it um, just so that we know um, if other cities are, are doing this work. Yeah, so Director Fitcher asked me to look into some of the policies of other, other cities, and so I started pulling the largest cities and trying to find which cities have uh, what policies around uh, consent searches. Out of the top 10 largest departments, one requires uh, consent forms be signed prior to searching any residences, that's Dallas, Texas. Um, most of the other cities require that it's documented on body-worn cameras. Uh, if it's verbal. Many cities have sort of a process where it's best if it's a signed consent form. If it's not a signed consent form, then it's documented on a body-worn camera. And if it's not documented on a body-worn camera, then um, they would have to get a, a, warrant, a search warrant. Um, so that's the process in most cities. Um, there's also cities like New Orleans where they're required to document on body-worn camera and get a signed consent form and notify a supervisor prior to conducting any search and have a supervisor present during the consent search. Um, Milwaukee has a, pro has a sort of stepped process um, uh, of if a person does not want to sign a consent form, then they can go to the body-worn camera's documentation. 
Um, in North Carolina, there's three cities that have a required uh, signed consent form in Durham, Asheville, and Fayetteville. Um, and then research in Fayetteville showed that uh, adding the consent form actually did not have major I impacts on, um, can, on finding evidence in searches, but it did reduce the number of, of searches where evidence was not found by 90%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was uh, what I found, and I can continue uh, compiling some of that information if that would be helpful for the board. Thank you. Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Valir. Uh, it would be helpful if I got if I had any reports. I would love to read those uh, just to make sure that I have the language. Second, I wanted to comment on um, being a being a being an initial member of the board, also working several different several years to get to this point, um, and being stonewalled, which created the backlog that we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. I want to say that the thing that that got this boy moving forward was escalation. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this as we've already been we've been functioning at an escalated point since they told us that it was going to cost thirty thousand dollars to do the records request or something of that, and they was going to print them off on all of these pages and put them on these discs, and there was no way of getting around that. Uh, and we've been escalated since you know Chief Anderson was sending all of us five-page emails in response to things that we were having conversations about here. So I just want to mention, like, escalation was the way that we got the ball rolling, even on the MOU's point. Um, there's one thing I wanted to mention uh, right here, and the community member was that, that's that been getting searched and that felt violated enough to fill out this mm -hmm. was already escalated. Uh, but I wanted to also mention that the heat map on page four um, that compares where the complaint were, were last year to where they are now, I think shows another um, narrative that now the complaints are way more spread out, right? We almost are covering the entire county with complaints. So it also feels like there's an escalation happening on the ground with these complaints. And I think it's our responsibility to do everything that we can mm -hmm. to make sure that these investigations are delivered and fulfilled in the best possible way in full um, in alignment with the charter which the community members organized to get off the ground. But uh, my main comment is I wanted to say like, this, this heat map really shows the expanding nature of, of the board's responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking through, like, if we need an emergency action uh, to get more resources mm -hmm. to our staff, I think an ordinance uh, with maybe support from Vice Mayor Brenda Haywood, who has come down here and mentioned that she supports us, or Sharon Hurt, or Quante Toombs, who was the, uh, who was, who was the chair of the Finance Committee. I think an ordinance to talk about um, the, the police vacancies that we already pay for that are already, there's already a, a line item, a lot of them there, maybe taking two of those vacancies and redirecting those funds here so that we can get two additional investigators. Because from what I understand, we had how many people to apply for an investigation position? 41? Yeah. yeah. It's like 41. So we have 40, so we have 41 people apply to join this team, right? And I think that that just shows how much people want to get involved. So I'm thinking if we can possibly holler at some city council members about drafting an ordinance to redirect some funds our way so that we can have two more investigators so we can get past the, the log jam that we have because of the stonewalling early on, mm -hmm. I don't, that don't sound like too much of a heavy lift. And I will add me. that OPA has 11 investigators. Mm -hmm. And exactly. you know, there's a staff of 13 and we have three investigators and the assistant director is kind of quasi <laughs> taking over investigations as well um, so I, I think that if you and I, I don't actually know what how many um, where they are with their numbers mid you know because it's mid-year but I did want to just make certain that everyone is aware that they have 11 um, sworn officers as investigators mr. Holloway uh -huh. 
OPA is a sore thumb. They need to be revamped from the top to the bottom. And uh, speaking of the search warrant, a uh, written uh, search um, was a volunteer from, from the family, and they signed. You, know, you got a form, they got a form, they can sign. The family can sign right there on the spot. You know, and I don't think they'd be letting them off the, off the, let them off the hook for not having any kind of paperwork for a search. Because mm -hmm. they only do it in certain zip code areas. Because mm -hmm. you do it in one uh, zip code area, you may not be working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mr. Hayes. I, I just wanted to thank the staff for this report. For sure. Um, that, you know, the, the COB policy recommendations, because I just want to reiterate, this is not just a piece of paper. What this document is supposed to do is supposed to drive the process. And there are things like de-escalation that is supposed to prevent some of the things that we're having to react to because you, tr you really need to look at the policy and change some of the things in the policy. So uh, I do appreciate this report being added in, and I, I, I will definitely be looking at it because I'm looking at not accepted, not accepted, not accepted, all those. I see some where it was partially accepted, but I, I, do, I will be taking a look at it, but uh, I appreciate the report. Thank you. Um, no, uh, Mr. Wynn. Yeah, I had a real quick, quick question, um, either, for, either for you or, or the director. Uh, I came in a little late, but um, I, you know, I'm encouraged the police department's looking for a mental health solution to a problem that's been a problem for a long, long time. Uh, and I, you know, I listened to both presentations. It seems like that, uh, are we being asked as a board to mediate between NOAA and the CIT project? Is that? No. It sounded like a competition when Noah came up and talked to what they could offer the city. Um, so what, what, are, what are we being asked to do here? Mr. Campbell, if, if I can respond, because uh, in the last meeting I suggested that we have <coughs> both of those models present. And the reason why is because we know, even with this board, we know that when, when community organizes in a way to change some, like an institution like policing, what we end up getting is not the initial intent. And I know Noah had been doing work over the past year of getting the Hills model done, but the response from the institution was to give them a co-response model. So having both of them there, I think, gave us both what the community was <coughs> setting out to organize when they started talking about mental health response, and then compared to what is actually being instituted. Right. So I don't think we're being called to mediate. I do think the piece that we should be called to do is being a uh, independent body to look at the data, which I thought was interesting that we're not being called on to do that, which is our initial function under the charter. Um, but hopefully we will. No. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Witzel. Um, uh, Councilwoman Porterfield did put that out at, at one of the, I don't know if it was the budget meeting or a, a council meeting that, um, or it was one of the budget meetings when they were talking about Hills um, having the COB um, be an entity that is able to uh, get access to that to that data. So. Mr. Goddard. Just real quickly, I don't think we're being called to mediate. I think our charter, and, and I defer to Metro Legal Disagree, I think our charter is plenty broad enough for us to look at that and issue a policy report of uh -huh. what we think that, mm -hmm. that ought to look like. Yeah, it just seemed like there was I heard You're politics right. and I hear. politics, and yeah. I thought, what, what, what is this? Uh, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know all the players in this, yeah, right. this Thank play. Thank you, Mr. So. Wynn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Fitcher? Yeah, I wanted to say one thing about this. I sent you all a, doc, a document mm -hmm. called Police to Peace. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was um, contacted by the Police to Peace executive director, Lisa Brada. She's out of Los Angeles. And she began to talk to me about a mediation program that was specifically tailored toward mediation between um, citizens of whatever of our city and police officers. And so um, she and I have had conversations. She's invited me to um, come, you know, jump onto some calls with other chiefs of police across the country. Um, I am intrigued by this program because it simply is only mediation 
um, tr with trained professionals who only mediate issues between the police and citizens. Mm -hmm. And what I really liked about the program is where it talks about the mediation. We've had this discussion in the past as we were preparing our own mediation um, program. Um, were officers going to be in plain clothes or, or, excuse me, or have weapons present? And in this particular uh, model, they do not. Um, they are plain clothes, no weapon present or visible. It takes place while they're off duty. It's usually off site, um, such as a community mediation center, city office, local library, firehouse. There's first names used only. Um, and it's a conversation between parties with light, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, not licensed, but you know, people who have um, that mediation experience. Um, Lisa Brodick also does like mediation between, uh, I think she's with mediators and borders. And so she's mediated with other you know, countries yeah. with their own like political issues. Um, and so I have asked her to send us more information about her program. Um, it's being utilized, I think it's been about a decade now in the Los Angeles Police Department. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to be super successful. She has talked about it extensively, but I'm, you know, in order for me to present something to you to talk about if this is a move that we need to make in Nashville, um, I think it's a discussion that she needs to bring here and talk to us in person or someone in her stead about why this program would be, uh, I think, a really vital way to move us forward in our mediation. Because currently, we don't have a whole lot of media. We try to get cases mediated but we just haven't been successful in it. Mm. And so, um, because I do think that there are a lot of complaints that could definitely use mediation, so especially those that are like discourtesies and unprofessionalisms. Um, we could, if we could have something that specifically addressed that, I think it would be helpful to our city. So, uh, so um, I'll bring that up at another time, but I wanted to bring that up there. So that's all I have. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Um, next on the agenda's public comment, if there is any. I don't think. I didn't hear you. Public comment. Oh, any public comment? No, I don't think so. There's then we can move to new business or announcements. Anybody? I have one announcement. Mr. Campbell. Oh, uh, we know that, um, and this is just about a new program that I've been working on for the past year. We know that poverty drives most of what we talk about here. Um, and poverty is a central issue that the community is, is, is struggling with. So for the past year, I've been working on um, launching a guaranteed basic income program pilot in North Nashville. And so for folks that don't know what a guaranteed basic income is, is um, it really has its roots in Martin Luther King's Poor People Campaign when he started to call for, in the Civil Rights Movement, started to call for a basic income for anyone struggling with poverty as a way of a direct action against poverty. Um, and right now, 53 other cities across this country are administering the same type of program, which means that citizens or community members, residents, that are making under a certain amount, right? Um, in Nashville, you need to make right around 51K to live here, but the medium income in 37208 is around 19,000. To fill that gap, what you would do is you would put community members on a stipend, giving them unconditional cash for a certain amount of time. And what usually ends up happening, like I said, this has been being done across the United States and has been done globally since the 70s. What usually ends up happening is community members are both able to restore their dignity, but they're also able to pull themselves out of poverty. So, um, what we're going to do is we're raising a million three and we're going to give it to a hundred families in North Nashville and at the same time we're going to study the effects. Uh, we're like a quarter of the way there but I wanted to let folks know because hopefully by the top of next year we will start our distribution of unconditional cash to community members struggling with poverty in 37208. Thank you Mr. Campbell Gooch. Any other new business or announcements? I just wanted to wish Brindsay Thompson, our community liaison, a, you know, wherever, I, I think she's still here, but, um, you know, safe travels as she moves over to another state, um, and thank her for the work that she's done with the Community Oversight Board. Thank you, Director Pitchard. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn.
Anyone? Do we have to? <laughs> I think we have so to. <laughs> no, I do definitely adjourn. Second. <laughs> Second. Any focus discussion? Uh, all, in, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Yes. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.